they can broadcast. So I'll just make sure he has a second to get going. Oh, there's Yevon anyway. A lot of attendees, given that there's not really anything on the agenda. All right. I think we're probably okay to go. Okay. Noting the hour and the presence of a quorum, I call the Acton Boxborough Regional School Committee to order. This meeting is being conducted remotely via Zoom webinar for our remote participation policy, BEDJA. The following members are in attendance via Zoom, Evelyn Obaya Isa, Kira Cook, Adam Klein, Jenny Kremer, Amy Christian Murphy, John Peterson, Nora Shine, Angie So, Evan Wang, and myself. Diane Baum is absent. Public participation is possible via the Zoom link or call-in phone number. Our school committee meetings are also live streamed on Acton TV's YouTube channel, although public participation is not possible with that option. The links and phone number are found on the posted agenda on the abschools.org calendar. This meeting is also being recorded and will be posted on Acton TV's website at actontv.org. For our remote policy, all votes will be done by roll call. I will call each member's name and they will state how they vote. Thank you for joining us. Um, welcome everybody. Sorry for the last minute change to um, a completely remote meeting, but as I have mentioned in meetings before, it becomes really difficult to manage um, both remote participants and in-person participants. And when we hit that tipping point of five for one reason or another, it makes it really, really hard to um, conduct it in person. So for that reason, um, we, we hit that we hit that that number and it just didn't make sense to do it. Um, both ways as a hybrid meeting. So thank you for being flexible and attending this way. And I guess I feel a little rusty doing it this way since we haven't had to do it this way in months, but here goes nothing, right? So the first item on our agenda is public participation. According to our policy, BEDH, members of the public may speak for up to three minutes on items not included on this agenda. Comments regarding items that are on the agenda should be made during that part of the meeting. Typically, the committee and administration will not respond to comments during public participation. So um, if I call on you um, and we allow you to speak, I, I may ask um, I may ask uh, what you'd like to speak about to ensure that it occurs at the right part of the meeting, because as I said, the public participation part is, is purely for um, items that are not actually on the agenda. All right, go ahead, Peter, you want to? Um, sure. Um, Corinne, you can speak. And also, I will hold you to the three minutes tonight. So you will get a one minute warning when you're done, when you're approaching your, um, the, your time limit. And then if you don't finish up at the end of that three minutes, then we will be using the mute function because we need to keep the uh, meeting running long. So. Go ahead, Corinne. I, I was going to um, make comments about the colonial mascot vote. Is that nowhere on the agenda? Um, as long as it's not in regards to the open meeting law uh, item, then you may make comments. Okay. All right. My name is Corinne Hogsett. I live on Seminole Road in Acton. I have one daughter remaining in the high school. I'm asking you to hold another vote to reconsider doing away with the colonial name and mascot. The process you followed in getting rid of the colonial was rushed one-sided, did not consider the input of the community, and likely violated your own naming policy. Although one member said at the September 17th meeting that she didn't believe the community should be able to weigh in on such decisions, that's not for any of you to say. You were elected to represent the community, not to act on your own personal, social, or political agendas. In a note to the community, the chair invited comments through October 14th. That prompted a student-initiated petition to save the colonial. Over 2,700 people signed that petition in a matter of weeks, compared to the 2,200 that signed the petition to cancel the colonial over a course of three months. In a memo written on October 13th, the chair broke down the emails to the school the school committee had received by 4 p.m. that day. Her tally showed about 40% favored keeping the colonial, 50%, 55% wanted to cancel the colonial, and about 5% had no opinion. Many of the people who signed the petition to keep the colonial were students who thought this was a way for their voice to be heard. 
When they and their parents learned that this was not the case, they started writing emails in the last two days before the October 15th meeting. Those emails tell a different story. While the chair's tally was about 40% to keep the colonial and 55% to cancel, the late emails were nearly the same in number but the opposite in opinion, 54% to keep and 42% to cancel. Both tallies included emails from people who expressed no opinion but implored the school committee to take their time considering this move to create a truly inclusive process rather than to rush to vote. Some of your own members even asked that the vote be delayed, but the chair wouldn't care of it. Now the community is split in half on this issue. This was entirely avoidable, but you couldn't resist steamrolling over the opposition. I also have concerns about the process. While the public was made aware of this petition on September 17th and invited to submit comments through October 14th, the school committee had the first reading of a motion to cancel the colonial during One the remaining. meeting. This, was, this made it abundantly clear that the school committee was going to rush this vote through regardless of the input they received. We already know the school committee was sympathetic to this cause, as one member had already said it was, quote, the right thing to do, and one member's daughter was one of the petitioners present at the September 17th meeting. Should these two members not have recused themselves from the deliberations and vote on this topic? I find it ironic that we have an assistant superintendent for diversity, equity, and inclusion, that this committee failed to truly consider the diversity of opinions throughout the community and include them in their deliberation. Instead, you alienated half the students, parents, alumni, and many members of the community. In a, member of about, no, in a matter of about two hours, the debate was over, the votes counted, and the colonial was canceled. You can do better. Vacate this decision, set up a comprehensive, inclusive process that allows all voices to be heard. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, uh, you can speak. Good evening. My name is Martin Benson. I'm a 2006 alum of ABRHS. During the last school committee meeting on November 5th, I expressed my concerns to the school committee that many members of the community are troubled by the way they consider to have been, are troubled by what they, ha they consider to have been an unfair process used to retire the colonial name and mask on October 15th, 2020. During that meeting, Chair Tess McKinley cited a naming policy which gave the committee the authority to retire the name and mascot. Thereafter, Superintendent Peter Light read aloud the opening line of the file FF naming district facilities policy and then referred to other paragraphs within this document. I have referred this, reviewed this document, and I believe that it is important for the school committee and the entire Acton Boston community to hear the entire first paragraph of this policy. Mr. Light read that the policy's opening line, which states, quote, the Acton Boxborough Regional School Committee believes naming or renaming a school building, structure, space, property, program, or other district asset, end quote. He neglected to read aloud the remainder of this, that sentence, as well as the rest of the opening paragraph, which continues after asset, quote, hereafter referred to as facility, is a matter of significant importance, one that deserves the most thoughtful attention of the school committee and the administration and one that is an unusual occurrence or event. Further, the committee believes it should not be influenced in its decision by personal prejudice, favoritism, political pressure, or temporary popularity." End quote. As a reminder, the school committee heard a presentation from a student group advocating the retirement of the colonial mask on September 17, 2020. Less than a month later, on October 15, 2020, they voted to retire the colonial name and mascot. In doing so, the committee violated its own policy. Last week, I submitted an open meeting law complaint regarding violations which occurred at the school committee's October 15th meeting. Tonight, the school committee will vote to authorize their counsel to investigate and respond to my complaint. I urge the school committee to consider One minute remaining. to adopt my concluded remedy instead. In return, I will then withdraw my open meeting law complaint without prejudice. As a remedy to the violations, I urge the committee to take the following three actions in abbreviated form. They are one, vote to vacate their vote of October 15, 2020 to retire the colonial name. Two, Chair Tessa McKinley shall issue the Act in Boxborough community an apology. And three, if and when the school committee decides to change the colonial name, it must spend a year studying the topic and be open to receiving input and suggestions from the community. In conclusion, during this pandemic, the town and the schools have more pressing concerns than mascots. However, the school committee and administration might disagree and feel that erasing our town's treasured history is in fact a critical issue that needs to be addressed immediately. If they come to this conclusion, the school committee should at least follow its own policy and not be influenced in its decision by personal prejudice, 
favoritism, political pressure, or temporary popularity. Thank you. Thank you. Charlie, you can speak. But his, he's muted. Yeah, yeah I'm with. Can you hear me now? Yes. I'm Charlie Cadillac and Pottery Road. Uh, I've been in town for a long time. During that time, the town has been noted earlier, previous meetings, changed its demographics rather drastically without the need to pass policies, decisions, re resolutions, and so on. It just happened because basically Acton is a very, very welcoming town. Look at the population. So I was really disappointed when I found out what's going on with the mascot, which I did not know about in the early stages. It has divided the town, which is exactly the opposite of what everybody says, the intent of examining our attitudes towards race and so on should be. Now, why did this happen? I think the students that generated this petition were doing what they thought would be appropriate. The adults that were guiding them failed miserably to make them aware of what this mascot situation may have been all about. It's not about glorifying some white, racist, miserable example of a human. It's to recall some of Acton's history, which is remarkable. When the mascot was instituted, it, it was not representing the then student body. It's related to the history of Acton. If the students now wanted the mascot to be more representative. One minute remaining. Thank you. Representative of who they are, that could have been done by having a discussion. I'm sure most people in Acton would be sympathetic to the students' desires. You don't have to get rid of something which to replace it with something else. Common ground could have been found. I think there is still time for that. Superintendent Light told me that this will take years to implement anyway. So there's time. I think you should start over, take a good look and create a situation where both sides can begin to understand what the other side is talking about, which has not happened. Thank you. Thank you. Looks like we have two more, Peter. Yep. Dave, you can speak. You need to unmute yourself. Yep. Can you hear me? You hear me? All right. So uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to overlook the fact that on October 15th, Ms. McKinley falsely stated that no group came forward offering to present in opposition for a time to mascot. There were groups of students and they were all barred from presenting. I'm also going to overlook the fact that the petition opposing retirement, which had to be thrown together in a few weeks and still had greater numbers, was summarily dismissed from consideration. Many alumni, community members, and students used that platform to voice their displeasure and were therefore ignored. Lastly, I'll overlook the fact that on October 15th, we had to listen to several members, most notably Ms. Abaya, go on discriminatory tirades herself about whites and about males, all while trying to loosely connect it to the improper definition of the school mascot. I have taken the time to read all of the emails regarding the mascot, and with the exception of a handful, every single letter in favor of retirement cites the wrong meaning behind the school district's name. Every single one. Just because two words can look similar, in this case colonial and colonialism, does not mean their concepts 
nor time periods are similar as well. All of you sitting on that committee know, or should know by now, exactly what the true definition of the mascot is. Conversely, the vast majority of emails opposing the retirement provided thought out, polite, and constructive feedback that not only cited the proper symbology of the mascot, but also noted its cultural significance to the area and its positive impact on the kids, while also offering up alternative solutions for actual social change. These emails were from alumni, current staff and students, community members near and far, progressive-minded citizens themselves, and even immigrants of color. This entire process and that meeting in particular were a shame to watch. One that meeting. was a premeditated agenda from the very beginning. Being destructive to culture, especially at taxpayer expense, is not making progress. It's nothing more than narrow-minded self-interest that is only creating more division. I certainly hope you all take a long, hard look at that vote you made on October 15th. Do the right thing. If discrimination is taking place in the school system, then handle it directly with the parties involved. But for God's sake, leave the school's name and legacy out of it. That's all. Thank you. Just one second. Leo, you can speak if you're on mute. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, I'm Leo Thotchman from Wright Terrace in West Acton. I'm very disturbed by what I learned about the process to retire the main colonials and remove the mascot. Thank you, Marty Benson, for bringing it to my attention. This issue reminds me of a favorite story written by Hans Christian Andersen in 1837, The Emperor's New Clothes. If you haven't read this story, please read it. And if you have read it, it's time to reread it. In the story, a very vain king has clothes woven from magic cloth that he was told could not be seen by anyone who was unfit for the office he held, who was very stupid. Everyone was afraid to admit that they could not see the cloth because they didn't want to be called stupid. It took a child to speak the truth. The emperor has nothing on at all. What would happen if we replaced the word stupid with racist? Pushing the narrative that colonials is a racist term and that anyone that wants to keep the name is racist is untrue. People, including students, are being pressured, in other words, bullied, into going along with this narrative to remove the name because no one wants to be called a racist. I want to state that the emperor has nothing on at all. And I'll repeat it. The emperor has nothing on at all. We were a colony of the British Empire, thus colonials. Does anyone remember the statement, no taxation without representation? We fought to gain our freedom from England by brave men and women. There was nothing racist implied by the name. And let me remind you that the first person to die in the Revolutionary War was Crispus Attucks, who was of African and Native American descent. He is buried in the granary burying grounds in Boston, along with Sam Adams, Paul Revere, and John Hancock. Do we have a perfect society? No, we don't. Are we working towards a better society? Yes, I believe we are. But to move ahead, we need to understand our history. One minute not remaining. Cancel it. But to move ahead, we need to understand our history, not cancel it. I had read that there was a recommendation to have a refresher about our colonial, colonial history in the schools. Did that ever happen? We need to have more discussion on this issue. Please rescind your decision to remove the name Colonials and the mascot until the community has more time to discuss the issues. Thank you. Thank you. Looks like we gained two more hands, Peter, since I said that was the last one. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, my name is Leela, and I just vehemently disagree with what's been said tonight. Um, everyone is entitled to their opinion, but not all of them hold water. Um, I hear people saying that the process was rushed, <laughs> but the process started over the summer, and the school committee has put in hours and hours and weeks and months into this decision, 
it wasn't like it happened in a matter of two hours, like someone previously said. Um, there's also claims that the school committee only heard from one side, but that negates all of the school committee's work to try and open it up to the community. Um, it, you could have spoken at public participation in multiple meetings, emailed in, or at the very least, there were multiple social media accounts and posts that would have brought your attention to this issue. Um, people were not alienated, and others have said that this decision has divided our community. Um, but to quote Ayanna Presley, unity at the expense of our freedom, equality, existence, and safety is not an option. We have sacrificed, shelved, and moderated our demands in the name of unity for a very long time. It's a long past time for justice, healing, and liberation. I, I think at this point in time, we have more pressing issues to deal with, and we need to let white folks be uncomfortable and fragile and move ahead with the decision that was the right thing to do. Thank you. Yep. Two more. Can everybody hear me? Yep. So I, uh, now my name is Scott Paul from Foxborough, 2010 um, alumni. I did have something written down, but I got a trade school education and you guys have zoomed, zoomed by me, so I'm going to make this short and brief. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak for the uh, student sport more more than the other stuff i think that people are more mad about you guys get getting getting rid of the uh colonial name um the um at a mascot if you want to change it around sure the whole thing sure but you can't just take take the colonial name out of back in box bro Act, acting box with a family, when, when you go to a sport event, in, indoor and out, outdoor, once you can come together, you're one big family, rooted on a team. If, if you brought this question to an AV basketball game and asked over the loudspeaker, everyone would look at each other saying, what, what are you talking about? All, all, all people want to do is is watch their AP colonials play sports, root on their teams. Let, let the other history go. You, you want good history? Go to the field house, lower gym, look up at the banners. Now now that's history. And I'm sure people, there, there's somebody there that can name each and every person on on that banner and and, and 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 tell a story about that person of how they fought hard to 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 make a record. Now now that's minute history. remaining. That that's the history that people care about. Eddie, of of other history that that could be left left that day. Some people are some people are, are against it. Some some aren't. But AB is AB is about the education and the sports. And if you remove the colonial, the back and box rule, what's what AB left with? We're, we're we're open to hearing the ideas of a different name, but we're all happy with with the colonial of back and box rule. Because it just sounds good, makes us happy, and makes us proud. Thank you, Scott. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. yep. Hi, my name is April Hirschberg, and I'm a parent here in Acton. And I just wanted to call in, and I, I just I agree with the students just now. Obviously, it's um, really important to be proud to be a part of the AB community. But 
I wanted to just point out that, you know, I've been listening to these meetings now on October 15th when the colonial mascot was retired. I was extremely proud to be part of the AB community. And I thought that the, um, the, the whole committee and, you know, the, the leadership showed a lot of hard work, dedication, and a very thoughtful deliberation um, over several weeks and months, and certainly on that evening. And I just wanted to voice my support of the decision and thank you for all the work that you're doing. Thank you, April. Okay, I don't see any other hands raised. Um, so thank you for all the public comments and we will move on to the next item in the agenda, which is the superintendent's update. So Peter, I'll hand that over to you. Peter, you're on mute. Oh, I'm glad that you, said you, that. you would think that if I'm the host of the meeting, I could figure out how to unmute myself, but you know, life is about learning. Um, so the superintendent's update tonight is actually also the public health update. So I'm going to go ahead and I am looking for, let's see, Don, do you see Joanne? Oh, there, there you are, Joanne, I found you. I'm bringing up uh, Joanne Chadwick, who is our, one of our lead nurses and um, has been a point person with us. Uh, throughout pandemic. And so, you know, I'll just do a little introduction and I'm going to share my screen as well. Um, I will say, you know, and I'm probably not the first person that you are going to have heard said this, but um, I think we're all extremely concerned heading into the Thanksgiving break um, about possible spread of COVID. We've been hearing public health, uh, public figures talk about this for a period of time. Um, it has us at least equally concerned at the school level. And, you know, we're certainly going to be sending a note out to families tomorrow, urging them to keep gathering small um, and try to stay local. I wanted to come to you tonight because I've, I've we've been monitoring cases since the beginning of the year. And in all honesty, we, we had planned this a couple weeks ago. Um, as just a timely update for you to review some of the overarching metrics we've been monitoring, share some of what we're seeing in schools. Uh, but in the time since we've planned this, and even since I've written the original memo, we've really seen a steep increase in the number of cases we're seeing here in the community. And it has me deeply concerned at this point about what we're beginning to see, not only in our public health data, but what we're seeing for cases in schools. Um, and that's really causing us, um, you know, me in particular as the superintendent, but us as a leadership team to have to really think deeply about what that means for next steps. So, you know, just to start at the beginning, and I'll, we're going to go through the memo that I had sent you, but present it hopefully in a little bit of a visual way and just talk through it. But we're going to talk about some of the key data points that we've been looking at. We will talk you through how we manage cases in our schools everything from working with a positive case to the contact tracing process and how quarantine and traveling works in the schools. We also want to talk through uh, the public health data and some of the recent changes to the metrics, but also give you the most recent update from the state website that was released tonight. Talk a little bit about managing risk and understanding that risk is um, not a one-sided uh, view. and It's not only about the public health risk, it also is about other risks that we have to balance. And then I want to share a little bit of some of the summary and key considerations. So um, I'm going to turn this over to Joanne um, to present a little bit and we'll trade off as we go between Don, Joanne, and I. Joanne's on mute. Joanne, you're on mute. Hi, yep. I'm, yeah, I'm one of the uh, nurse leaders in the school district and um, I've actually been working as uh, the major sort of COVID point person and working with Peter and Dawn and the principals and the team of nurses. And I have to first say that I think the work's been tremendous and I really thank everybody. The communication has been very good and everybody's been putting in a lot of work to try to keep um, students safe. And also I'd like to thank families because we've spoken to a lot of families 
and uh, everybody's had incredible understanding and patience and we're very grateful for that. So um, these are the numbers that you see. Um, currently, I think as of tonight, um, I could be a little off on this, we've had 27 positive cases reported in the school. So that number 24 is now outdated. Um, there's been, um, the thing that we're particularly interested in is transmission within the school. And, you know, we're very happy to say that's, that's only happened in one instance currently, that, that could change any day. Uh, that's transmission between people within the school. And I think that speaks to the, you know, the very uh, good planning we've done, all the work we did about uh, ventilation, having the, the students wear masks, trying to keep everybody six feet apart, um, following the protocols, the hand washing, the use of sanitizers. So we're very, we're very happy with that. So what we're, we're seeing is COVID coming in through, um, you know, uh, coming in from outside of the school. And we, we have also seen uh, cases coming in through sports, not, not necessarily school sports, but um, extracurricular activities that students are involved in. Um, so that's a breakdown of uh, the reasons that we're tracking them. So maybe we could go to the next slide. Okay, so I think that's 27 positive cases. Um, what happens with the positive cases, um, we, we look at them on a weekly basis and um, we break them down. When Peter puts the, the metrics out, we break them down by the different schools. And this these numbers are reported to the boards of health on a weekly basis. We work very closely with them. Uh, we also, um, in the one case where we suspected there was in-school transmission, we were able to utilize the rapid response unit from the state. And what we did, everybody who we had identified as a close contact, which was, I, I can't remember the exact number, I think it was like 23 families, we offered testing. Um, we had people drive up to the Parker Damon building stay in their cars and have the testing done and um, we were very pleased that we didn't find an, any spread within that group of uh, students um, okay so maybe go to the next slide um, i don't know if peter or Dawn want to speak to that that slide sure this is um so i actually put in our our cases and you know maybe we have to reconcile a little data but um I actually think we might have gone over 30 cases as of today. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I actually think we hit the 33rd case uh, of the school year today. And, you know, what was has been telling to me is, you know, in the first you know, month and a half of the school year, uh, we had probably a total of around 10 cases. And you can see these broken down by school. These have been on our website. Um, but since November 1st, we're seeing a real spike in the number of cases that we've seen. Um, and that's a concerning trend. Um, I think in the back of my mind, I was hopeful that maybe the spike could, you know, maybe initially have been attributed to Halloween. Um, and then we would see, you know, a dip in the cases, maybe heading into this week. But we really have not seen that slowdown. Um, we had, you know, another case yesterday and then four additional cases uh, today over the course of the school day. So um, it's already been an active week for us. And that's, you know, as I said, that's, that's increasing our concern so um how we how we um what we do um the key as i said we, we have collaboration between um the building the building principals the building nurse so the how we work it is uh the building nurse becomes the lead professional from the nursing point of view when we get a case in a building and uh we use we use a tracking form that um, we all have access to, and we also share with the Board of Health. And we can we can try to keep a note of um, people who have tested positive and all the close contacts. Um, the major thing we do when a test when somebody is identified, we we either hear of it from a parent calls us, or we hear from the Board of Health, or um, sometimes we've even had an email from the the student themselves. What we do, we look at um, we look at the date. We look at uh, when they either became symptomatic um, or they tested positive because we have people who are testing for procedures like dental procedures or traveling. Um, when we get a positive, we have to trace back 48 hours. So we go back 48 hours 
And then what we do, we convene a Zoom meeting with the building principal, vice principal, senior, senior uh, management, myself and the building nurse. We identify the, identify the close contacts and then let us go out. But before that happens, uh, the nurses, sometimes with the help of administrators, but usually the nurses contact each one of the families um, with a telephone call because we think it's very important to speak to people because you know, people have different needs for the level of explanation and information they need. We make sure that that is followed up with an email and a letter that day. And then um, we try uh, as a team of nurses to follow up with the family two to three days later, just, just to make sure people understand um, the information we've given to see how they're getting on with the testing protocols. And then we ask them to keep us um, informed because sometimes you know, we need to know what the test results are. Uh, we also, also want to know um, if they if any other close contacts have been identified that we initially probably hadn't identified. So that's how we've been doing it. So it, it has meant that we've um, most of our work has been uh, communicating with families and telephone calls and the Board of Health. So that takes up a lot of time. Um, also, we um, I'm liaising with the um, the school physicians. Um, and the town nurses. So we're just trying to make it a very much um, a team approach. And I would say, I think the collaboration and communication has has and is working very well to date. Uh, uh, to what Peter said, I think the last two to three days, it's beginning to get to a point where it's, um, it's constant. We're not getting much of a break between cases and we are, you know, we have had to put a lot of students out onto quarantine um today three three different uh, groups of students had to go out today so you know we're very aware of the disruption it causes and um as i say families have been very understanding is there another slide there is okay and there we go oh so quarantine we're calculating that from date of exposure and that um until yesterday when your guidance came out, that was 14 days. To, so the day you're exposed is day zero, and then we calculate forward. There has been new guidance, which we're discussing, which might change that with a 10-day quarantine with a test at day eight. Um, anybody that comes into the health office unwell, if they meet the criteria, which is set out in the documents on the transition site, we send them home and um, ask them to test before they come back, otherwise they have to be out 14 days. And also the nurses are following up with everybody that calls in on absentee lines every day because um, we need to, you know, why, why people call out. So, you know, we did feel initially that was somewhat intrusive to families, but I think people again have been very understanding when we call and say, you know, your child was out sick and you just give us a little bit more information. And it usually means we have to ask them for a COVID test. The other issue that we're seeing more of now is traveling, um, people traveling out of state. Uh, we're keeping up to date because the states that you can travel to change all the time. I think possibly in the next day, a couple more of the states will come off and then it will be almost all 50 states. Uh, it'll be like 48 states that you, you um, when you return, you have to wait 72 hours to get a COVID test. And we need to see that test result before uh, students can return to school. So um, it's becoming, I mean, with Thanksgiving coming up, it certainly is becoming more of a, a challenge for us. And um, we're also finding that um, families are having family members visit for Thanksgiving. So they are testing, just thinking, you know, auntie's coming or grandma's coming, I'm going to test. And then uh, people, are, asymptomatic people are testing positive. So we are seeing more of that. That's something we're seeing more of since uh, in the last couple of weeks. I'm going to shift and talk a little bit about some of the public health metrics. Um, one of the charts included in the memo was a comparison of the previous public health metric that DPH had used to categorize communities and then a comparison with the new metric. And so, I guess about a week and a half ago, or maybe two weeks ago, um, EPH and DESE jointly released this new metric, uh, along with some guidance. And the intention of the metric was, in particular, to focus on smaller communities, like Foxborough, with a population of under 10,000 residents, 
And to be able to, at a more granular level, um, code them properly within this kind of stoplight, you know, red, yellow, green, and gray system, uh, because they were finding that the metrics, um, particularly with smaller populations, could skew how the data appeared. So, you know, you can see a little bit of a comparison, but what was kind of interesting to us, um, in addition to, you know, providing for the clarity around the smaller populations, the, the state also, you know, more than doubled some of the thresholds. Um, so, for example, if you look at, um, like, the, the yellow level, let's take, for example, the prior metric uh, was that if you had between four and eight cases per 100,000 residents, that was considered yellow. Um, now the new yellow is if you have over uh, 10 average cases per 100,000 residents or uh, greater than 5% positivity rate. So if you had four cases previously, you would have been yellow, and now if you have 10 cases. Uh, so changes like that, I think the state's intention is to be able to keep more students in school. Um, but it's been certainly a challenge to make sure we can translate that uh, public people to be able to come. This is today's data. As of 6 o'clock p.m., the state relates, released um, information on the website. And this is the first week where we've actually seen Acton go into the yellow uh, in terms of the categorization. So we, in Acton right now, we are at 10.5 uh, average daily cases per 100,000 residents. Um, and we're still at just about a 2% positivity rate. On Boxborough, uh, we have nine cases over the last um, two-week period total. And so that still keeps that community in the gray. So just a little frame of reference. Um, incidentally, Middlesex County is seeing, I believe it was 25.6 average daily cases uh, per 100,000 residents. So that's a very steep uh, increase over what we can see since the beginning of this week. This is a chart for comparison purposes over time. You can see uh, since the beginning of the school year when we started tracking this information. On the left is the town of Acton. The top chart is tracking the average number of average daily cases per 100,000 residents. And you can see how we've progressed in particular over the last three weeks. Uh, we had been hovering anywhere between about one and a half and three cases pretty consistently uh, for the first you know nine or 10 weeks of school. Um, and then since then, we've seen that very sharp spike. You can see this recently gone to yellow. And the chart below that is the percent positivity. And that's showing a, a, almost a parallel uh, increase to that. In Boxborough, you can see the average of the cases starting to rise. Uh, so, you know, that community would likely go into green in another week or so if the cases continue to rise. Uh, I won't speak to the bottom chart because I just, just talked to that for a minute. One thing we have done, though, um, I thought it was important because we had been tracking metrics since the beginning of the year in a previous system that the state had published. So I've been continuing to publish that on our website just for comparison purposes. People who are interested and like to keep track of data. Um, and if we used the prior state metrics, what we would see is in Acton, uh, we would have actually gone into the yellow two weeks ago, uh, around about November 5th. Um, and last week we would have almost been red, and this week we'd be significantly into red or uh, nothing says no, into red. Um, and then in Boxborough, you would see a similar spike, and, and they would have passed that red metric. Um, and again, it's based on the old data. Um, I think Acton's maybe a more realistic picture of that, but Boxborough I think does get skewed. DESE has also issued some updated guidance, and I apologize for the number of words on the page here. I did cut out some from the memo, but it's still, it, it's awfully wordy for a slide. Um, but what I wanted to do was do a little comparison of what DESE's issued for guidance and how we're considering our decision making. Um, you know, districts are expected, according to DESE, to prioritize in person learning, uh, which we absolutely agree with, across the color coded categories, unless they're suspected in school transmission. Districts and schools and communities designated are gray, green, or yellow are expected to have students learning fully in person. And then there's this caveat that says if feasible. 
Um, schools in red communities should implement hybrid models while maximizing learning time for time each students. And in those communities with the highest uh, COVID-19 caseloads and test positivity, DESE and DPH are going to work with efficient strategies. Um, DESE does note all remote instructional models I thought it was also important to talk to you about some of our considerations because there's a reality to how some of this plays out in schools. It's a challenge. Um, one of our considerations, if we were to close our schools, would be because the overall public health data no longer supports in-person learning um, because we're seeing a high degree of community transmission. Uh, we're certainly seeing that rise into a concerning level, but we're not a red community yet. Another reason we might not open our schools is there's evidence of COVID-19 um, is spreading within one or more of our schools. To date, we have only one um, suspected case that's connected to another school-based case, and that was in October at the Miriam School. Um, of the current cases, right now we don't have any suspected transmission. How we are we are monitoring one of two of the close contact right now. To see if that does come to a, uh, another case that's transmission. The third reason we could close is because simply the volume of contact tracing that results from an increase in positive cases in our schools exceeds our ability to do it safely and with reasonable certainty. We need to know that we have the available staff, time, and resources to contact trace every single positive case with accuracy. Um, because if we can't do that, we can't safely keep our schools open. And then, you know, fourth is also an extremely important consideration for us. The number of students and staff who are required to quarantine could result in a substantial negative impact on their ability to offer an effective learning program. Um, I talked to Marie earlier today, and you know I don't want to quote this number, but I believe she said it was somewhere on the order of 39 staff right now are in quarantine across the district. Um, that's very concerning for us. We also know that over the last, um, you know, I think even just today we had probably. I think Larry said between 30 and 40 high school students quarantine, and we had 50 high school students quarantine the other day. Um, there can be a really significant loss of work when students need to quarantine. So that's something that we also need to consider. I think you know the message that I want to send is we absolutely understand and support the state's goals in having as many students possible, but there are a lot of considerations that we have to be thinking about beyond just state metrics. To determine if we're able to keep our schools. Um, you know, I can tell you that as of last week, I felt we had a good handle on where we were at. Um, to be very, very honest with you, as I come in tonight and having had, you know, four cases today and five cases so in the last couple of days, I'm becoming increasingly concerned about um, where we're at. Right now, I don't have any answers for you and I don't have any decisions about what that means, but I want to be honest in my assessment of where we stand right now. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Don for a couple of minutes to give you maybe a bit more positive of an assessment of why we want to try and keep our schools open as much as possible. Thanks, Peter and Joanne. Um, we've been spending an enormous amount of time uh, together lately, and I'm very thankful that uh, we have one another and we have such an amazing team. Um, as many of you remember, um, I spent 20 years in Michigan and did not we didn't have school nurses. Um, and so when I got here and you know was told that that's one of my areas of supervision, I'm like, what do they do? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> And, and in those four years of normalcy, I was like, wow, they do so much. It would have been really cool to have school nurses in Michigan. And now this year, I'm like, I am really concerned. I don't know what it would look like in a school that doesn't have a school nurse in terms of what, what the, the types of things that our nurses are doing and tracking. So um, I just can't even say enough about how much um, my respect for them continues to grow every day. So um, one of the things that we look at certainly is this balanced approach to risk risk. I think Peter um, did a nice job on the last slide of sort of, you know, uh, when we talk about balance, there's a lot of things that we're balancing. Um, and so, you know, Joanne mentioned earlier a lot of the evidence-based strategies that we have implemented since September when we reopened. Um, and, you know, it's really important for us to recognize that, you know, a strategy to reduce risk um, is different from a goal of having zero COVID cases because there's no such thing as, um, you know, a risk-free environment right now. And 
particularly in the case of the pandemic. So, um, but we do know at the moment, the data um, and what we're seeing from public health metrics right now um, is that schools are not major contributors to the spread. That could certainly change over the holidays as more and more kids are coming in. Um, and, you know, as Peter and Joanne both shared, I certainly share a number of their concerns that um, they've expressed with the, the really sharp uptake in cases we've seen in the last few days. Next slide, Peter, please. So as we think about risk mitigation, um, we have implemented a lot of key strategies for our, for buildings and keeping them healthy. Um, we actually attended a webinar last week with Joe Allen, who runs the Harvard Chan um, School for Public Health and um, their Healthy Schools uh, initiative, which we've used for many years to help inform um, our approach to HVAC and ventilation in our buildings. Um, and so we've look, looked at a whole bunch of different um, strategies that come from the risk reduction piece, but I love that that um, Dr. Allen spoke about buildings as breathing, and it gives me such a good um, visual to think about that because they really are. And so the more we're able to leave windows open a little bit, doors open, get air purifiers, um, all of those things, it allows the building to breathe um, and it allows the building to remain healthier. So I do think that the warm fall and other uh, it has been a huge factor as we've um, really looked at, mit at mitigating risk. Um, in a lot of cases, we actually exceed industry standards um, in many of these areas, and we implemented a whole lot of strategies. They're outlined on our Transition to School um, website, which I'm sure you all spend a ton of time perusing because there's so much information there. <laughs> um, but there's information on our HVAC systems, our COVID-19 control plan, our custodial training protocols, and the, the products that we're using right now very building specific operational plans. So what does it look like in each one of our buildings? Um, and those are all publicly available. Also, as we opened our schools, we did purchase air purifiers, which we shared with you earlier in the year um, for spaces without, in, without operable windows. And that was over 200 different spaces. Some of them are smaller offices that are on the inside of the building, um, but we do have um, some newer builds where the windows were not made to be operable. So in order to continue to maintain our high um, and healthy indoor air quality, we are, we've just purchased a whole bunch more of um, these air purifiers. So um, to help us in the winter months when it's gonna be challenging to leave the windows open all day, um, they'll still be open for little periods of time, but um, we've ordered air purifiers for all of the classrooms and we hope they'll be installed in the next couple of weeks. Um, so that's another piece that we're, we've implemented. And then um, I think the other, the last thing that I wanna talk about, next please. Um, is really the long-term effects. And this was one of the sections in um, our report that we put together for you, um, where Dr. Ashish Jha, who you've heard, you may not recognize the name, but you've probably seen him on the national news. Um, and he's the, currently the um, Brown University Dean for the um, School of Public Health. And um, he was done, he did an interview on November 2nd, where he talked about the large mental health cost to children. Um, he talked about the, what, the achievement gap widening between wealthy and poor students and between white students and students of color. And he, he spoke about the long-term effects um, that we're going to feel for a long time. And he said, you always have to weigh those very large costs against the cost of going back to in-person education. Districts that are being too cautious are doing enormous harm to children and families in their communities. And then if any of you caught the um, press conference last Friday that the governor did, um, Dr. Mary Beth Miato, who's the vice president of um, the Massachusetts chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, spoke and she talked about her own practice, her own private practice, where um, within the pandemic, pediatricians are seeing rapid weight gain in children. They're seeing this increase in sedentary lifestyle, limited physical movement. They have a lot of concerns about nutrition and the amount of screen time that children are seeing. Um, and I know that my mental health team um, can definitely speak to the last one as well around youth hospitalization and suicide attempts. And most of the folks that Dr. Um, Yoto speaks to speak to the fact that there are far more um, instances of youth who have been hospitalized for suicide um, attempts than there are youth su uh, COVID cases um, in the Commonwealth right now. And so that is, and a lot of these kids never had um, previous um, behavioral or mental health concerns. And so that certainly is really, really um, hard to think about. She reports that that's just typical children bending or breaking under the stress of the pandemic and from being 
you know, home alone or alone for long hours at the computer. Um, and my favorite part, though, of what she shares is that um, many children struggle academically, but schools aren't just about learning. Schools are places to find trusted adults. They're where nurses help manage chronic diseases. They're places where children get extra healthy meals when food is scarce. And schools are places where friendships and mentoring provide safe havens for growing youth to establish healthy identities and ride out tough new emotions with the support of caring and experienced adults. And so this is really tough because we, we I think, are already seeing a number of the, the different effects um, with the students with whom we work, um, who are both in person and in our remote learning. And um, it's, this is a big, it's a big piece for us to weigh as well. So Peter, I'll turn it back to you. You're muted. <laughs> um, there, I think I'm unmuted again now. You so, didn't give me a bug yet to say that, so that I don't have to say it anymore. I can just hold it up. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, I can't see you though because of the screen sharing the oh. screen. <laughs> um, so, you know, some some really key questions. Um, you know, a lot of this data, I think, as we see upticks in cases um, across the state and across the country, you know, we need to wonder if schools will continue to show that they're not a source of transmission as we see increasing number of initial cases in schools you know it's one thing to say that they're not sources of transmission um, when we're not seeing cases come into the school but now that we're seeing a significant number of cases in the school will schools continue to keep that spread down i think is one question we have to monitor um, will our state and nation take steps um, as significant as those that we're seeing in europe I think one thing that you know we're hearing a lot about is Europe's ability to keep schools open while closing the rest of the country. Um, I think there have, you know, and and this is a tough judgment to make. There were some priority decisions made there, um, where they did close down other sectors of society in order to make sure that schools could remain safe to be open. Um, and you know, we have to see if our state and nation are willing to keep those safe steps to be able to do that. Um, or if we're considering everything a priority, um, which, you know, again, from a lot of lenses is understandable, but, um, you know, it certainly can make it challenging for schools to operate in that environment. Will our community continue to adhere strictly to all of our safety protocols, including mask wearing, social distancing, rules on gatherings, um, hygiene as we enter the holiday season? Um, you know, we continue to be concerned about this area. Um, you know, we do know that, you know, we're just about right now um, almost at the peak number of cases we saw at the height of the pandemic in the spring. And I think it's a good opportunity to pause and ask ourselves if our personal behaviors now mirror our own personal approach that we had in the spring uh, when we were seeing almost 3,000 cases. And I think you, almost universally, we have to say no, we're not behaving in the same way. Um, I think, you know, we've become accustomed to wearing masks, um, you know, sometimes to a point where we think of it maybe more as a shield than, you know, one tool. Um, and while masks and social distancing and, you know, all these rules, you know, they no one tool we have at our disposal is going to solve this pandemic. It's really about the whole combination of these things. And, you know, if we're seeing the same spike, we have to think about, you know, behaving in such a way at an individual and family level that, you know, mirrors some caution so that we can try and keep schools open. And then I think, too, you know, one thing for our district is as we start to resume indoor sports, um, and that's, you know, not only our district, but all the districts and youth sports that take in the winter as well. Um, will we see any increases due to the indoor nature of those sports? Um, you know, we're hoping that we don't. Um, we know that youth hockey has been a particular challenge across the state, um, and there have been some additional restrictions on that. You know, sports are incredibly important to students who are involved in them. Um, they're a piece of their identity, and so we want to try and maintain those things, but we do have to wonder if we're going to see increased transmission um, as we move into the season here. You know, and then... You know, I, I've talked a little bit about um, concerns that I have. You know, we're at really a crossroads, I think, in some decision making. We're hearing a real push, and for all the right reasons, um, from the state to be thinking about trying to bring more students back. Um, and, you know, 
we we saw the language at the state level that spoke to the need to be fully in person, um, but there's this caveat of if feasible. And there are some pieces in the state guidance where right now for us at Act in Boxborough, it's just not feasible. Um, I know that the governor visited Carlisle um, and, you know, I know Carlisle well, I know the superintendent there, and I'm thrilled that they were able to, to be fully in person. Um, but their average class size is probably about 15 total students. Um, and, you know, that's as many students as we can fit in an entire high school cohort. So it's just not a comparable um, district. So I know for some of us, it was kind of frustrating that that was the example of what, you know, can happen to be fully back in person because they're able to get every student in and still have six feet. Um, you know, there's inconsistent agreement still among some of the medical experts about whether or not less than six feet um, is appropriate. Um, you know, we hear some reports that say you can go down to as little as three feet, particularly with the youngest students, but that the adults really need, need to maintain six feet. I think for us to consider that at some point in the future, we need to see really consistent agreement among the medical experts, and we need to see that congeal uh, for us. Transportation is also a particular challenge for us. Um, when we operate a normal transportation system, go back one year from right now, we're putting, you know, three elementary students on every seat on that bus. And right now, the max we can operate with is one. Um, we don't have the transportation system that we can add, you know, 20 more buses. Even if we had the resources to do it, you would never find the bus drivers. So, you know, unless something changes significantly in terms of our understanding of how transportation works, that would be a challenge that has to be overcome. And then, in all honesty, access to testing is something that um, it really needs to be a priority for our state. Um, the testing program that we heard the governor announce the other day, we explored that. Um, and in discussions with our health department, with our own nurses, and with our school physicians, we determined it really not the appropriate solution for the challenges that we have. Um, that was rapid testing. And it's only to be used if you have a symptomatic individual in a school. Um, but in our conversations with our internal health professionals and our consultants, um, you know, the, the rate of false positives and negatives on those still remains high enough that it, you know, could really run the risk of keeping, you know, symptomatic individuals in the schools. So it was not a good option for us. You know, we would love to see state really expand the use of surveillance testing in schools using a PCR-based test as opposed to the rapid tests um, so that we're getting good, reliable results. We continue to explore this at the district level and try and find ways. Um, we have another meeting tomorrow um, with a vendor that's working with Broad Institute to try and figure out how we can bring this to the district. I'm hopeful that we can make some progress on that over the next week or two. Um, but I do worry about asymptomatic individuals in the schools uh, because that could be a source of transmission that we're just not ready. And it's something that we want to think about. Before we get into questions, you know, you know, I have to first say, you know, thank you to Don, thank you to Joanne, thank you to every single one of our school nurses uh, because they're working countless hours behind the scenes to make sure that everyone's keeping us safe uh, throughout this pandemic. Um, we know all of the risks to students, um, you know, and I'll be honest with you tonight that as I look at some of the public health data increasing and I look at the number of cases we're seeing in schools, it's weighing very, very heavily on me that we have thousands of people on a daily basis who are entrusting their health and safety to us and to the decisions that we make. Um, you know, we're, as I said before, we're really at a turning point here. Uh, we're seeing a sharp increase in the number of cases. We're, um, you know, seeing an increase in community spread of the virus um, at levels that worry me a lot. And, you know, I think we're going to meet as a leadership team um, tomorrow, have some more discussions about this in the morning. But I'm also interested to hear some of your feedback tonight. You know, and with that, I'll, I'll pause and, and stop sharing and see what questions you have. So I'm just going to remind everyone that it's way easier, Amy, if you raise your hand in the in the chat thing than than if um, because there's so many people on the screen and it's too hard to keep track of whatever. 
Um, I also want to note that I know that there is an attendee that has their hand raised, but as we always do in these um, conversations, I'm going to have the discussion with the committee first, and then um, and then we can take questions from the community. Um, so, Kira, I actually think you had your hand up first. The following directions. Sorry, Amy. Um, all right, go ahead, Kira. Um, Peter, I'd love to know a little bit more about how many um, staff hours it takes to um, do the contact tracing when you get a positive, um, when you when you get notification of a positive test, um, and and knowing the strain that we already have on our staff, um, just doing all the other normal operations, um, is there a tipping point for those staff hours um, around contact tracing that? Um, we should anticipate or be concerned about um, as, as we go forward. Sure. Um, I'll let Joanne jump in as well on this, um, but I can say, you know, the tipping point today when we, we got four cases, luckily one had not been in school for over a week, so that saved us a bit of fun. Um, but the other three cases, you know, that, that put us close to the tipping point within a day, um, you know, which I think is the result that, you know, Joanne, Don, and I had to kind of make up the presentation as we went. Uh, we were we were creating the slides, I think, at about 6.45. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, apologies for that, by the way, everyone. Yeah, I, I would I would say um, uh, for two nights this week, um, myself and some of the other nurses have been in the building. Um, fly, uh, you know, uh, junior high, we, we, we usually finish by three. We've been there till nearly six. Uh, I was at the high school. I left at five today. Um, yeah, we're, we're putting in a lot of extra hours. It depends, and it, it, it depends when the, the calls come. But you know, then um, Dawn is doing an incredible job. I mean, I don't know how she's doing her other job because you know she's sending out all the letters and the notifications. So it's it's a huge part of our day now. I would say that in terms of time, Kira, to sort of quantify it. Um, it, it depends on the level, um, and it depends on how many classes are, um, are involved really. And, you know, at the elementary level, it's a little bit easier because we usually take out the whole class cohort and the, the greatest time factor at elementary is calling the families. Um, at the secondary, it's chasing down the bus attendance and the bus seating chart and then each classroom and each classroom seating chart and then attendance and then you know so there's just a lot of moving parts but everybody is so great about sort of knowing which part they need to do and and coming together um but i'd say one case if you took all the time that everybody spent i'd say it's probably good eight to ten hours if you took all the time that folks were spending across the different positions um i mean it wiped out our day today that's all we did so um you know it's easy that you know we start a day with you know, delusions of grandeur and very quickly end up, nope, that's going to be set aside for safety. So. All right, Amy, thank you. Sorry about that. I'll, I will use my hand raise from now <laughs> on, Texa. Thank you for the scolding. Um, I, so one thing I wanted to ask was a clarification and it's going back into your presentation where you talked about the metrics and how they were originally and how the governor changed them. And I'm, I'm just wondering, was he moving the goalposts to, to try to change our reactions to the whole COVID situation or what, how do you see this? You know, I think, um, I take a pretty balanced approach in, in view of that, I mean, it certainly did move the goalposts. I mean, there's no no doubt about that. But I think you know, the governor doesn't certainly doesn't operate in isolation, nor does DPH, nor the Department of Education. Um, you know, everything that we've seen out of them, you know, is generally well, not generally, almost always in consultation with you know Harvard Medical School, Mass General Hospital, um, you know, the pediatric association within the state. I mean, there, there's really, you know, we're lucky to live in Massachusetts because there's a good number of medical experts advising in all of this, and we're fortunate to have some of the best in the public state. Um, I, I do think that there was an intention, though, to make sure we provide metrics that allow schools to operate. I think, you know, um, 
there, there's no decision that anyone can make in this pandemic that is going to be the right decision every time. And I think the early metrics were the best guess that everyone had around what would work and what would be good thresholds. And I think what we saw at the state level was there were a lot of communities that didn't have really widespread cases quite yet, but were going into the red very early on, and in particular mm-hmm. some small communities that were being yep. put into red. And when you looked at the total number of cases, they might only have eight or nine cases in the yep. whole, whole town, but they were showing up as red for several weeks. And that, that was really knocking a lot of kids out of school. So I think it was done with good intent. It definitely moved the goalpost, um, but it was also not ill and full. If that's a if that's a balanced assessment. Thank you. I just wanted to add that I completely agree with your uh, decision to not participate in the rapid testing. Um, so everything I've read about it shows that it is you know there are as many false positives, false ne- negatives as there are true responses. So thank you for standing up for that. Um, and I'll just say very quickly to thank you so much to everyone who, Dawn, I mean, all of you that are working hours upon hours to, to, to try to find a way to keep our kids in school. Because honestly, you know, it, you know, it, it, we know that it's the best thing for our kids. And I, I just, I really appreciate it. I also don't want to leave Marie out of that discussion either, because Marie is, one of the people making all of our staff calls, and I want to make sure she gets recognized for that. Uh, Absolutely. And, Marie and is a freaking time. superstar. No, freaking <laughs> superstar. Absolutely. I agree. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> all right, Adam. Thanks. <laughs> First of all, thanks to, to Joanne, and Don, and Peter for the presentation and for the work that you're doing and that the rest of the staff are doing. I know that it cannot be easy for a nurse or a principal or an administrator to have to make all of those calls um, when when uh, when doing the contact tracing. So I really appreciate that. Um, I, I have a question that sort of relates to maybe what some other folks in the community are 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 wondering, um, and I, and I'd like to just sort of have us uh, <clears throat> understand the your your opinion on this um, with the the trajectory that we're on and with Thanksgiving coming up, why not just go fully remote following Thanksgiving? So I think, you know, one, um, we started to hear that, you know, a month and a half ago, you know, what about going remote after Thanksgiving? And one of the commitments I've tried to make throughout the pandemic is we're going to look at the information in front of us and make good decisions based on what we're actually seeing. Um, I think what we've all learned through all of this is it's very hard to speculate about what's coming next. Um, you know, I know that there are going to be people who wondered, you know, if we'd make it a week and a half into the school year before we had to shut down again, um, you know, and, and kind of we're, we're playing the odds that that wouldn't happen. And so, you know, here we are coming up on Thanksgiving and we've had a, a really nice educational program. Um, so I, I firmly believe we need to look at the data. Um, with that said, um, what I'm sharing with you tonight is I've started to become increasingly concerned over, you know, the last few weeks, but in particular, the last 72 hours about what we're seeing in this. Um, I, I'm not telling you I have a decision tonight about what we're going to be doing, uh, but I uh, all I can say, you know, to be really honest is I think there's a lot of things in play, um, and I want to be able to talk with our leadership team tomorrow, look at some of the data, um, and make good decisions, but I'm really not ruling out anything right now about what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks. Thanks. And, and to be clear, uh, I am fully in favor of giving every one of our students as much opportunity to be in class as possible. Um, but I, I think that there are there are clearly uh, people in the community who have that concern. And so I think it's important for us to be frank about that. And and also, you know, from my perspective, make sure that we're, we're prioritizing the, the learning community as a whole and giving students every opportunity to be in class. You are muted. I'm busy eating my dinner because I haven't gotten to eat yet. Yeah, Ben. Thank you, Tessa. So, yeah, uh, I really appreciate our nurse and also uh, district staffs to keep our community and our, our students safe. That's uh, tremendously 
of effort. So, uh, but we needed to keep working on it. That's, uh, but so I have uh, three questions or comments. Can I go, Tessa? Are they related or are they three separate? Yeah, it's related to uh, COVID. Okay, so if, if they're relatively related, then I'll say yes. We're, we're not on the hard timeline of being in the building tonight, so I don't want to go forever, but go Okay, ahead. thank you. Uh, so this is a probably goes to the uh, jobs. Uh, so because you mentioned that some cases are tested just because of the procedure or something, it's not a for, for the showing the symp symptoms. Right? Mm -hmm. So I kind of agree with uh, Peter's uh, concern like, uh, the number of positive cases doesn't really, I mean, show the severity of the, our community uh, spread, right? It could be also a lot of cases maybe asymptomatic. So how many, I mean, what's the percentage of the positive cases are really symptomatic? Uh, that's, that's actually a very good question. Um, do, we, do we have that data, Peter? What percentage of our positive cases were symptomatic? Were symptomatic. Yeah, symptomatic. Um, it's we really do in the spreadsheets. Yeah, we're at like 2.2%. Well, it's probably different after today. We were 2.2% positivity when we look at every yeah. kid that we're tracking. Um, and so I, I think maybe half that of kids that were symptomatic before they... Uh, and uh, and, uh, and I, I would like to add there that... Um, also, some of the um, some of the cases we've seen, it's, the symptoms have been incredibly mild. It's um, it's you know we've we've asked kids to go home with a very very mild symptoms, or um, you know their parents reported that you know they went to bed with a bit of a headache, had a slight tummy upset, and it just seemed a little bit off. I mean, the, the, um, we've had kids more sick than that, but we've heard that the symptoms have been very mild. Okay, so uh, thank you. So the second question is to Peter actually. So you showed us the criteria over the entire district, right? So to say this is a like yellow, green, or whatever. So are there any criteria at a school level to say take actions? Yeah, so those um, we've actually shared with the, the community before in, in on our transition website. At an individual school level, it's going to be based on whether or not we're seeing internal transmission within the school. Um, you know, we, you know, spoke at length with the Miriam community and Miriam staff um, when we were concerned that we had kind of a, a connected case in that community back in October. Um, when we enacted that uh, mobile testing unit, the rapid testing, or not the rapid testing, the mobile testing unit um, in October, you know, internally, we said we were about one more positive case in that group away from closing Miriam for a couple of weeks um, to allow that to kind of clear itself out. Um, you know, I think on a school by school level, it's it's about the transmission. You know, so if we were only seeing transmission in the high school, for example, then I would not be concerned about our elementary schools, and I wouldn't be concerned necessarily about the community. Okay. okay. But what's concerned me is we're really seeing cases come in in just about all of our schools at this point. Um, and that, that that's a different type of concern. Okay. Well, uh, thank you. You know, last one. Uh, so what do we learn from the source tracing, like uh, the source of the positive cases? Like, say, this could tell us something, right? So we can take preventive um, measures more actively. Say, I just make make up some examples, right? Examples. So like, because keeping in-person learning is as much as possible of our interest, right, always. So I was wondering if, if the source tracing tell us the family gathering or a big, big, big party or big gathering is a, is a big, plays a significant, significant role in the positive cases. Can we advise or come up with some policy? Say, if you coming back from that big gathering, you should bring a negative test. I think I think the the cases that we've seen have come from a variety. They've come from uh, family gatherings. We know some have come from sports, like um, 
hockey and uh, uh, informal gatherings at um, you know uh, fields and things like that. Um, we've also had cases where there's tra traveling people traveling back. So um, my feeling is we've, we've more or less seen the whole range of uh, where the sources have come from. So I think it's a, it's a question of people trying to adhere to the, the guidance put out by the state about, you know, avoiding gatherings. Uh, we've had, you know, we've had a case in Actonwell uh, also with uh, dining. So it's, it's, it's crossed the whole spectrum. So I don't, I think the guidance that we have, which is in line with what the state is saying is, is, is kind of on point right now. And I don't feel that we've seen any trends from anything particular. Yeah, but you, you have, uh, say, in the, uh, you actually, in, in one slide, you showed uh, if you, uh, if uh, people come back from uh, travel, right, mm -hmm. then uh, he should bring the uh, COVID test. Right? Yes, absolutely. And that's that, that kind of, uh, it's a, it's a recognition of the, say, traveling is a, it's a high risk activity. Right? Yes. Yeah. And yeah. keep our community safe, let's do something like that. Yes. I was wondering if, because also like Dr. Fauci or a lot of, lot of people just want uh, I mean, a lot of people say this, let's uh, be careful with the uh, bigger gathering, right? Yeah. And so on. So I was, it's a, re, it's a really totally reasonable to me if we identify that's a primary source yes. of uh, all the cases, then that's because we wanted to keep our community safe and mm -hmm. keep our student in person learning as much as possible, that's important. I would say uh, we can do something like that requirements for that category as well. Yeah, but I can actually jump in on that. Um, so we had an incident earlier um, this fall where we had a group within our in one of our schools that had a gathering that exceeded what the governor's order is allowed. Um, and so we actually had that group of students quarantined for the the full 14 days. Um, you know, we've also investigated some other reports that have come to us. Um, and, you know, if the facts lead us to believe that a, a group is gathering in violation of an order, we're always reserving the right to have the group quarantined. Um, so that's certainly in play. I don't think there's any new policy we need to enact to be able to do that. At some point, there's, there's judgment because I think uh, what we're seeing is there are so many different types of issues that come our way um you know we just have to you know at some point just use good judgment in the moment and, and think through what we're seeing and, and make a decision about it um it, it's it's also interesting because it's putting us to be honest in a very uncomfortable position with some some of our community you know we really as schools do not want to be the community police around gatherings um and it's not putting us in a great place to have great relationships with some of our families um because we understand why people want to get together. Um, it's not typically our role in society to police it, but we're finding ourselves that we need to do that. And we recognize it's a challenge for everyone, but it's something we certainly do. Well, yeah, people have a total level of freedom, right, to, to get yeah. together. I mean, just, but, but uh, people also bear the societal responsibility. Uh, so let's be not be selfish, right? So. Sure like a wearing mask policy. Can we do something like that? I, I, I'm just making up some assumptions, right? Scenario, maybe it doesn't exist. Okay. Oh yeah, that's all. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jenny, Angie, if you have to want to raise your hand, you need to raise it in the, in the um, using the raise hand feature. Thank you. Um, so I just want to say, personally, how incredibly frustrating it is to get these platitudes from the state and a, a gubernatorial visit to a, a district like, like um, Carlisle and absolutely no assistance to districts um, for, for what they're dealing with. Um, <clears throat> I spoke to our rep, Hanny Gouveia, today, and, and I want to clarify, Peter, that although we have um, you know, doctors and, and some nurses on these teams, there are the, there are absolutely no public health professionals have been included on these state COVID teams. And there's a huge distinction 
between healthcare workers and public health officials. So, you know, that's a very, very important voice that has been completely left out of this conversation. Um, you know, this is really concerning. And uh, just in talking to people in the community, there are certainly a lot of people who are still planning to have fairly regular Thanksgiving gatherings, um, you know, who feel that because there are people in their family who they've seen periodically that, you know, somehow that, that makes um, having Thanksgiving indoors, you know, eating with masks off um, safe in some way. Um, so to me, I, I, I think we really need to start thinking about our students who most need to have in-person learning. Um, and, you know, and planning for, for that contingency because, um, you know, I look at, you know, I, I think our junior high students and our, our high school students, many of which, I don't know if it's most, are, you know, they're kind of living like little college students with, you know, on-campus days and then not on-campus days when they're having to kind of direct their own learning. And for some of them, it's not ideal, but it's, it's working. And then I talk to parents of, of kids who are, you know, young elementary school students, and this is just a disaster. It's a disaster for their students learning, despite, you know, all the best efforts of our teachers and staff, but it's a disaster for the students, um, social, emotional health, education, and it's a disaster for parents who are trying to work <laughs> and can't sit next to their kid, um, you know, and, 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 help them manage. So um, I just want to say, I'm, I'm just throwing out there that I, I, I feel very worried going into Thanksgiving and what it's going to mean for, um, you know, a few weeks down the road after that, which of course is, you know, the full on holiday season and all of our staff and students and nurses and everybody who's worked so hard um, and, you know, I don't know if it's time to have a contingency plan for our, um, you know, our, our most vulnerable students, students who don't have, um, you know, access to support or um, infrastructure in terms of an internet connection, um, or who, for whatever reason, just cannot, are not managing and are, and are really falling behind. And I'm not saying that that's a discussion we want to have tonight, but I'm just putting out there that, um, you know, if this goes totally sideways, those are the kids that, you know, I think that as a district, we need to be the most concerned about. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I would agree with you on that. I, I think our whole leadership team has been thinking a lot about that. Evelyn? <clears throat> thank you, Tessa. Um, thanks to the team for all the hard work you're doing, Peter and Dawn and Joan and all the nurses. Um, I just wanted to find out, um, Peter or Dawn or Joan, whoever wants to answer this, what is the projection for when we think we can have schools um, open? <laughs> How much longer? And also, um, I was curious, We the state just got in um, a monoclonal antibody infusion, which my institution and a few others, and I think um, Brigham and women have the honor to infuse, is called Bamlanivibumab, is a monoclonal antibody. And um, I hear that there's some good news about the vaccine. I know that um, a friend of mine whose son is in there. Um, Air Force, they're getting vaccinated tomorrow, and there's eminent FDA approval. How much of that information is disseminating through DESI to the schools, and how does that factor in to um, how long we're going to have these the schools open, and what the vaccines are going to look like, and all these therapies that are coming down the pike? I'm just curious, are we going to come back to school after Thanksgiving? Um, is there any promise, any discussion around these therapies that we're supposed to be giving to people, including the vaccines and all that? I'm just curious how, how what your take is on it, or Desi's take. So 
right now, um, the information we're getting on vaccines is the same as you when we watch the evening news. Um, you know, that, that's been the only information that's forthcoming to us. Um, you know, I have heard some reports that, you know, at least one of the vaccines, you know, it's going to be immediately available to healthcare workers um, and education is not going to be in that first tier because we're not the ones, you know, intentionally dealing with, with sick people. Um, but after that, educators are in one of the very early tiers. Some of the reports I've heard, you know, place um, educators, you know, possibly even having the vaccine as early as March, um, you know, where we might have the educators vaccinated. Um, in that case, you know, you know, I, as soon as we can get our people back to school, we're going to bring everyone back to school. Um, that would be my goal. We just, again, we have to do it safely. Um, we will not be coming back fully <laughs> right after Thanksgiving. I can guarantee that. Um, you know, I don't, we're not going to really start discussions about trying to bring people back fully while we're still seeing a spike um, in the virus. Um, I just, you know, I, I don't personally feel like I can look anyone in the eye in good faith and say, this is the right time to be bringing more students into our schools. Um, as we see more and more cases evolve, we're finding kids that are asymptomatic. Um, as I said, the, the pieces that need to fall into place for me to be able to put a real timeline for this are expanded access to surveillance testing for our schools. Um, you know, really clear um guidance from the medical and public health community that distancing of less than three, less than six feet um, is, is good um, and is a good idea. You know, we, even at three feet, we would struggle to get everyone into our schools. Um, and we know some of our classrooms, it would be less than three feet of distance to try and bring everyone. Back. I was really thinking, um, I, I wasn't referring to when we're going to get kids back to school fully. I was thinking, and we're gonna get a lot of questions about what is the projection that we're not gonna be going back to the school. <laughs> More um, about, are, we yeah, our schools? Are, we, are we gonna be closing schools because um, hospitals are filling up and yeah. um, beds are getting shot? As yeah, I don't know if you're looking at the state data. Yes, there's a spike, and and depending on how you look at the data, the second stage has begun. We thought it was going to be at the Thanksgiving, but it really has begun, and people are calling it a stage. But in my hospital, as of Tuesday, we were, we were at capacity, <laughs> and there were folks sitting in the emergency room with no bags. And so I was just trying to pick your brains about, realistically, are we going to be coming back to school after Thanksgiving? And is there a projection for when we think that we will be? And as much as I think that we should be in person and it's good for the psychosocial health of the children, I, I think that given everything that's going on, I don't know that that is a realistic. If you asked me two weeks ago if we were coming back from Thanksgiving, I would have said we're definitely coming back after Thanksgiving. If you you know asking me that tonight, I'm going to tell you I don't know. Um, that, you know, I'm, I'm just highly concerned about what our, what our data looks like right now in the number of cases. Um, we are going to be talking about it as a leadership team and, you know, certainly making some decisions and we want to make sure people have ample warning if, if we're not coming back. But I, I just, you know, I just wish I knew, but I don't know tonight. Thank you. Sure. John and then Angie. Uh, from a government's perspective, the first thing that I want to say is, you know, I think that um, this decision about operating mode of the schools is, you know, appropriately vested in Peter and the leadership team. Uh, and the presentation tonight makes it clear why that should be so. Um, because, you know, there is no simple objective measure that we can look at in terms of you know, new cases or positivity that can tell us what the right answer is. Um, and I thought the presentation did an excellent job in understanding, in, in explaining how certain things were under stress. So it could be that the reason that we can't continue to operate is because we simply don't have enough student attendance, or it could be that we can't support the contact tracing that we need to do. Or it could be something that we didn't even talk about, like the fact that we had a whole bunch of bus drivers go out sick, and now we can't transport students to school. 
Um, and, and I think the other thing that the presentation nicely did was to illustrate that, um, it, you know, we still have, you know, a huge desire to provide in-person education, that we know that that's the best education that we can provide. Um, it's good for students. And, and conversely, it's bad for students when we can't do it. Bad things really are happening. Um, so, you know, I'm very supportive that, of, you know, of course, you know, um, Peter and the leadership team should listen to school committee members and community members. But when all of that's done, um, just as they've done tonight, they should sit down with all of the information available, look at all of the factors that are involved in how successfully we can operate our schools, and then make a decision about what operating mode really uh, is best for the whole community. So, so in that sense, you know, I found the presentation you know, perfectly satisfying, although I know there are always people who would be much happier if there was a simple objective measure. You know, if the number hits 20, we know we're going to close. And this just isn't going to look like that. Um, and then the other comment that I wanted to make is that um, a few people, you know, in the course of their lives will have the chance to save a life. Um, and there is the chance for each of us, you know, in terms of our behavior, over these next few months to save a life. We may not know the life that we've saved, but if we can play a role through, you know, minimizing our number of contacts, you know, and our behaviors in reducing the spread of the virus, lives will be saved, you know, and it's clear that that's the case. Um, so like everybody else, you know, I was hardened um, by the news of the vaccines, but I think Peter has, you know, correctly cast this as, um, this is something that's going to start to turn things around in the springtime. Um, but that means we have December, January, February, and we're on our own. There is going to be no magic bullet in that time frame. We're going to be looking, I think, at a situation very similar to what we have now, trying to understand you know, what the prevalence of disease is in the communities, um, and then adjusting our individual behaviors, you know, and our behaviors, our operations of our schools to try and minimize the spread. So um, I, I just want to remind everybody that um, everybody has some opportunity to contribute, you know, to the communal good. And, and I hope everybody will take that to heart. And, and over the course of these next, you know, three or four months, um, to the best of their ability that, that they'll do that. And maybe it's a little bit easier to do that, seeing that now maybe there's some light at the end of that tunnel. Angie? Hi, um, just want to start with uh, thanks to the leadership team and the whole team together that uh, hand in hand that we have, uh, we, got, we have sustained that the school is open for two and a half months now. So I think that's a, a accomplishment. So it's great that we are not only care about the health, we also recognize that the short-term and the long-term impact. I'm really concerned actually the short-term and long-term impact. So the question I have is around it, I have two parts. So the first part is when we make the decision um, at this crossroad, do we also take this short-term and long-term impact into consideration? And do we have any data that we collected um, for the short-term and long-term impact of our students? So that's the first part of the question. So this, and the second part is because we're in two and a half months now, and a lot of things have changed. So I know how hard it is to for the school to juggle the the schedule if the the student want to um, from hybrid to remote or, ver or vice versa, but. But, but the family knows the student the best, and there may be short-term and long-term impact on the student significantly after the two and a half months of now. So what is the opportunity, how open the school will be considered if families want to change because they may see some short-term and long-term impact with the student? Sure. Um, so Angie, I want to make sure I answer your, your question thoroughly. Um, the first part of that, could you give me some examples of the type of data you're you're thinking of for short and long-term impact on students yeah. that we might collect? Because I'm not not quite following that. Well, in the well, in the I don't have the slide, but they're in the uh, short-term, long-term, and uh, there is the uh, the weight gain, there is uh, the screen time, and there is uh, the hospital, the suicidal visit, and uh, you know there is our student who does not didn't have. Uh, mental behavior problem and but now started to have 
those are the data I was look, looking at. You know, I think um, we certainly actually, Don was working with, um, I keep wanting to say Metro West um, Health Data Survey, but that was my, my former group that I had, um, Emerson College, and Emerson College. <laughs> Hospital, where hospital um, around doing a short survey around some of that information. Um, so we actually are trying to partner with some regional districts to do something like that with our students, but we know it needs to be short given the pandemic. Uh, Dawn, you want to just say a couple of words about that? Um, yeah, so I, I actually, it's interesting. I haven't necessarily seen any really specific reports about that, Angie. A lot of it is a collection of anecdotal um, reports from a variety of different providers. So whether it's the um, director for Elliott um, Community Mental Health Services, who um, d deals with the uh, outpatient uh, mental health services for young adults to adults in our communities um, that surround Emerson, um, whether it's the pediatricians, whether it's so, so, so we're hearing a lot, whether they're our own physicians, whether they're, um, you know, folks through MDPH and other things. So I actually anticipate that any old day now we'll start to see some very crystal clear um, reports that are coming out. But I think so much of it is just so new that we haven't, we haven't seen anything, you know, super concrete that says, you know, here's the, the impact. I think a lot of it is just people who have done this work for a lot of years that, that, you know, there's a growing body of concern around it. But, you know, as soon as there is data, we absolutely will bring that forward. And, this and then the second one, I think, was around transitioning between programs. Right. Um, you know, I don't see any updates to the, the process and policy that we have in place around transition between programs. No, we've been taking requests since the beginning of the year, um, but our staffing levels are pretty limited at this point. Um, you know, we have a certain number of teachers allocated for remote and a certain number of teachers for in-person. Um, and, you know, in the remote class size is certainly a concern and we can't overload classes there um, or else the quality of experience diminishes for students. And then in the in-person instruction, we're really limited by making sure we can keep six feet of distance between our students. So, you know, we've been taking, we have, you know, a handful of people on a wait list. Um, but in all honesty, as soon as spaces open up, um, as the year progresses, we make changes for families. So, you know, our goal is to try and make as many changes for families as possible. But we do have some of the constraints, you know, really continue to be a challenge for the year. Okay, thank you. Sure. Can I ask one short question? Angie, we're already so far over. If, if, Nora has her hand raised, Kira has her hand raised. I have a question. There's an attendant attendee that has a question. If there's still time, I will come back to you, okay? Nora. Thank you. Um, echo what everybody else is saying. Thank you for the, the time and the um, listening to expert opinion and just your knowledge around um, managing this incredibly difficult situation. I think probably because of my um, my professional job, I, I think a lot about the impact of students who are um, you know kept out of school during quarantine or who aren't able to return. And and I had a question about that. I know you're going to be learning a lot in the next couple of weeks, like you said, just because the numbers have gone up so quickly, and you'll be learning about in school transmission and whether or not there will be more of that now that we have more students in the schools who have had. COVID positive tests. Um, my question is around the length of time for quarantine. Um, I have heard some information that that might be shortening um, based on the um, limited return to positivity after being tested negative. And also I was wondering about how close contacts are defined. Um, I know that one of the big impacts of contact tracing for COVID in the schools is around just the number of students that are out and the number of teachers that are out and the amount of work that has to go into contact tracing. So I'm just wondering about how, um, how close contacts are defined within the school and if it is always the entire classroom that would be considered a close contact or if in some situations it would be fewer students than that given the way that students are spread out and wearing masks and open windows and kept apart. Um, so I, I'm just wondering how the close contact is defined in the length of quarantine. 
So, Joanne, you want to take that? Um, you're correct. There was a guidance. Um, there, it was published yesterday. The guidance came out um, that it's, it's changing the length of quarantine. They're now saying um, 10 days. But on day eight, the individual has to test with a molecular PCR test. And then um, they have to be symptom free. They test on day eight or nine. Then on day 10, quarantine can end. But then for the remaining four days, up to day 14, they have to self-monitor for symptoms. So currently, that's under discussion with between um, the leadership team, the Board of Health, and the school physicians. So we're looking at that because that, that does have implications, especially when we're putting whole cohorts out. If you now have people having a different end point, depending on when and if they choose to get um, a test, you can have people coming back on day 10 or day 14. And if you put a whole cohort and a teacher out, that does have implications for that. So that's something we're talking about. Um, the second part of your question was about contact tracing. Yes, you're right. In the ideal world with perfect filtration, six feet and masks, there should be no close contact. But um, we have always erred on the side of caution. We also look at something called congruent um, contacts where you have a group of people within a uh, a room or an area for a prolonged period of time and the time is cumulative over the day so you could have students sitting next to somebody in period one and then in period seven and that total time is for that student is two hours um, we look at that and um, we also look particularly closely at as dawn pointed out on the buses and then also uh, and lunch time you know we know the students are six feet apart and it's a short period of time but it is more than 20 minutes and they are a master that time so, I mean, to date, erring on the side of caution has worked well for us. Um, how much longer that continues with the, um, the spike that Peter has, has referred to uh, remains to be seen. And also, you know, we're going into a winter period with drier air. Um, that's why we're buying the, the purifiers. Um, you know, the windows have been open to date, but that, that's also impacting, I think, what's happening currently. And just, you know, I think um, just to piggyback a little on what Joanne said, you know, because of that idea of congregate context, that's why we treat elementary schools different than we treat junior high and high school. Um, the students in junior high and high school are moving every 40 minutes or so or 45 minutes to a different group of, of individuals. So they're not spending an entire day in a classroom. Um, but at elementary school, most of the people in that classroom do spend pretty much six hours together, including some lunchtime without masks and things. Um, so we're more conservative in that. There are times when even in an elementary class, a student might only be in a classroom for 30 minutes or 45 minutes, or a staff member may come in and out, uh, particularly our assistants. In those cases, we're much more targeted. Um, and we really try and dig down as to how much time a student spent or a person spent in the room, who they were near, you know, who they talked to, did they touch anything, things like that. But uh, in general, the elementary school were pretty conservative because of the amount they spent. Thank you. Sure. Sorry, I know you have your hand up, but I'm going to ask a question because I haven't asked one yet. Um, so, um, <laughs> Peter, I know that from, from listening to the presentation that we're not really going by any one particular metric and that it does get a little... Um, dicey when you look at what our actual capabilities are with contact tracing, with staffing, with, you know, the number of teachers who are actually out, with the number of students who are actually out. So given that we may make a decision to take a pause, um, to take a break and, and close for a little bit, um, I think that something that is unclear in the community is how that is different from last March, um, because I know that the expectation is that we would then come back and that it would truly be a pause, whereas a poor, as opposed to in March, it was like, we're closing down and that's it, you know? Um, and I think it's worth maybe talking a little bit about, since there are sort of fuzzy metrics around what might make us take a pause, what might be the metrics around what would allow us to then go back. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think if if we're coming up on a pause, it's, you know, for right now, you know, our, our existing challenge is staffing coupled with the number of students who are quarantined and the continuity of education 
coupled with, you know, you know, increasingly higher numbers of cases in our schools in a short period of time. But the real, you know, the, the low person on that total poll is actually the public health metrics. Because the public health metrics alone um, still could support in-person learning. That, that's not a, an automatic shutdown. Um, so I think, you know, depending on what we see, you know, I think with, you know, a significant number of cases, if we were to take a pause now, it would be for a very finite period of time, and we would then reopen um, once we were able to kind of close for a period of time to kind of squash the infection that's growing. Um, now, that's completely dependent on people's behavior at home, too, um, and we know that that's a challenge. You know, if if we close for a period of time and, you know, families and students don't change behaviors and kind of close down with it, um, then we come back and it's right back where we started. But if we can kind of clear out any budding infections within the school community, then that can be helpful to staying open longer once we do come back. Um, you know, so it's, you know, we're not in a place where just public health metrics alone are going to drive us. Um, and so I'm, I'm not really concerned at, at that level that, you know, we're shutting down and we're staying shut down. I just don't see that happening right now. Um, but I guess I didn't a year ago see that we'd be doing this either. So, you know, I, I, you know I'm not going to say never, but I just don't see that imminent on our horizon. Um, in terms of the, the learning program that we offer, you know, when we shut down, that was price of schooling. Schools had never operated um, in a pandemic since 1918. Um, and a lot has changed in that time period. So, you know, I think, that was really about trying to just get by and kind of keep kids afloat. At this point, even if we close down, we're going to keep education moving. Uh, kids, you know, all kids will be receiving synchronous instruction from teachers during the school day. Now, we're not going to put kids on Zoom for six and a half hours a day because it's just not appropriate under any circumstance. Um, but certainly there's synchronous instruction um, taking place throughout the day on and off. Um, teacher schedules, you know, we've been working with schools so that in a, a short-term closure, um, we might follow a more typical current schedule, like what we're in, and keep the cohorts separated. Uh, but if we believe we're, we're going to close for any longer period of time, then we actually have a schedule um, that would provide daily instruction for all students. So um, it, it really, you know, kind of depends on the length of closure and the circumstances we see ahead of us. But, you know, this would still continue to be full education for our students. Thanks, Jay. Sure. Um, Kira, did you have another question? Uh, not another question. This will be really brief. Thank you for letting me speak again. I, I just, I, 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 I thank everyone who's been working so hard on this and echo those comments that everyone else has said. I also want to recognize um, the educators on the remote learning program side who, is, should we have to um, take a pause, as people have said, um, and pivot to something else, they'll be sharing the best practices that have been cultivated for the last two and a half months. So it, it will still be crisis schooling, we totally get that, but it will also be different because on the other side of this, there's a program that's been evolving um, and, and really, really dedicated educators who have been practicing in this situation successfully for two and a half months. and. Um, it's my understanding that they're they are sharing already and that they would continue to share um and so i just i just want to also um recognize them for the public record that they've been um they've also just been incredible and, and val has been an incredible leader um and those teachers would step up to share their best practices um so that the children in this district will still get something excellent even after the pivot thank you for adding that because i would echo that tenfold. Um, you know, there's been a real steep learning curve for everyone on that. Um, our educators have been fantastic and the remote teachers have done an absolutely tremendous job adjusting. All right. Um, before we move on to the next thing, it looks like um, Corinne and the audience has a question. Yeah, Corinne, you can unmute. Hi, Hi thank you. Um, I have a question and a comment. Uh, my question was from very early on in, in this presentation. How many kids have been forced to quarantine? 
Oh. I thought that was in one of the graphs. I heard heard like 50 went out today, but I'm saying total throughout the 10 weeks, how many kids have had to quarantine? Um, let's see, close contacts we've had, well, the data we published were from about, oh, I'm going to say beginning of the year up until I think we did the memo on the 15th or 16th. So it was 284 people. And of that 248 students, um, you know, that's gone up significantly in the last week. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to, you know, I would guess somewhere in the order of 100 or so students, maybe 125 in the last week, but that's right. that's only a guess. Okay, so we don't know about this 125, but of the 248, do we know if any of them ever developed any symptoms or tested positive? Um, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Okay, so we've had zero transmissions involving students all year long, but we've quarantined 248 that never got sick. I can tell you my daughter was one of those kids, and she, it, it, she fell behind, okay? And despite the really excellent outreach from the deans, the counselors, the support staff, the kids fall behind. And it's stressful. And it seems like it was pointless because they were never going to get sick. They, <laughs> so there's that. I have to, okay, so that's my, that's one comment about the quarantine. Um, I also, I have a, my uh, younger son, I moved him to private high school this year. He's in five days a week. There's a thousand kids in this school. The class sizes are 20 to 25 kids. Same protocols, same everything. The only difference is three foot distancing. They have had, I think, I get fewer notifications from that school than I do from AB about possible um, cases in the school. So maybe it's comparable, but um, I can see in my own home what a stark difference it is between my previously, I could care less about school son and my super high achieving daughter. It's just night and day. Um, my daughter has never struggled ap- academically, and this year she's having trouble. Um, at least one class, there has been there was no accommodation made at all for the fact that there was no learning last spring, or that they were only in two days a week this year. And so I, I, I get that the teachers are working really hard. I get that they've had to make adjustments. I get all that. But in the end, I really don't care how hard people work if the result is that my kid only gets a half-time education and she's harmed by it. Um, I think that these, these first 10 weeks of school we've had, again, that there's the fact that there's been no transmissions in the school, this, we've been, this district has been far too risk averse. We've had practically no community transmission this has been a wasted opportunity, 10 weeks, that we could have had our kids in full time. And already tonight, I'm hearing this body talk about when are we going to go fully remote? And I'll tell, I'll finish up. That's the biggest difference I've seen between the public and the private. The private school, the public schools have been, how long, how long are we, when are we going to be remote? How, when are we going to be fully remote? And the private high school has been, what can we do to get these kids back on campus and keep them here? And that's all I have to say, but thank you. Thanks. Okay. I don't see any other hands or questions. So thank you to everybody that put so much work, even if it was right before the meeting, (laughs) to putting together that presentation. And thank you um, for all of the work that you do every single day to um, make sure that our students are safe and to ensure that um, our schools are safe places for them. I really appreciate it. And I know we had a lot of nurses in the, in the audience and I appreciate them attending the meeting tonight. And um, I think you can see on the faces of some of our administrators, how very tired they are from all the work that has been going into this. So it is really appreciated. Um, is it okay to move on to the next agenda item? It is. All right. So thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Joanne. Marie, you're up. Well, that is a pretty tough act to follow. 
somehow enrollment data does not seem all that important right this minute. Um, but I am happy to share. So I'm going to share my screen. So um, we have in your packet um, is our annual October 1 enrollment report, which has a lot of different types of data around our current enrollment. Um, it's certainly a different kind of year. We have the RLP information worked in there for you. And um, at the in the FYI are the details of the NASDAQ projection. Um, which is our projection for enrollment over the next um, 10 or 15 years. The, um, we have been relatively flat for four or five years. And then the last two years, we've had quite a bit of drop. So um, in the presentation, I have um, really shown the two year change here, um, roughly a 3% drop each year. I'll talk about kindergarten separately. Um, but elementary is down 83 students, of which 20 is at kindergarten. Um, and the junior high is down 29 students, and the high school is down 65 students. For a total of 177 this one year. Um, last year, we dropped 155, so somewhat proportional to, to those same numbers, although the junior high was a bigger drop last year. They had had kind of a two-year uh, increase blip, if you will. Um, so we certainly had some kids either go to homeschool or um, pull out of kindergarten to start next year, theoretically. So we're in the process of surveying the kindergarten and first grade parents who pulled their kids out of school um, for this year to find out if they are, uh, what they're doing, are they coming back next year? And if so, which grade? So that will better inform our enrollment for next year. Um, kindergarten, uh, this is the enrollment projection comparison and it's honestly pretty disappointing. It was off quite a bit. Now, again, we know some of this is sort of the kids who pulled out to do homeschooling or to wait a year to enroll. Um, but the enrollment projections were over by 149 kids. So our actual enrollment is 149 below what the projection said just a year ago. Kindergarten in particular, the projection was 330 and we're at 278. Um, and when we compare the projections, I take out the choice kids and the staff kids because we're projecting only Acton and Boxborough residents. Um, and so that was a pretty big um, difference. And we're, we're guessing about 20 of them pulled out because of COVID, but still we came in quite a bit below projection. The um, Acton was 33 students below projection and Boxborough was 19. And when you're talking the difference between 74 and 55 in one elementary school, that's a pretty big difference, 26%. And to show you historically, the kindergarten vol volatility has been there. Um, it's really amazing to me. So the chart at the top, um, the over and under projection, we've been off by 40 to 55 students in both directions or out of the last five years. Um, and we, there's a company that does it for us, NASDAQ. They are very good at this. It's just, I think that's how unpredictable kindergarten is. Um, and down below, it shows you the historical numbers for Acton, Boxborough, and total kindergarten. Interestingly, Boxborough, 54 this year, they had projected 74. And I remember telling you, I'm going to, 
I'll bet you it comes in in the mid 50s and it did. Um, interestingly, I think next year's projection is mid 50s and then they go right back up to the mid 70s for three or four years. Um, so it's, it's important to watch that because if we maintain the hometown guarantee at 100%, we could run out of space um, to fit 75 kids per grade if, if that actually happened for more than a couple of years. So we watch it closely. You can kind of see the history here. This chart goes from 2005 to 2030. The line up the middle is the current year. Um, we are pretty close to the lowest enrollment for the district on whole. Um, just over 5,000 students K-12, not counting choice students. Um, and then we break it out by level. So we are at the bottom for elementary and projected to go up pretty quickly over the next seven or eight years. The junior high is a little bit more up and down because it's only two grades. Um, so as I said before, we had kind of a, a two year increase here and now it's come down three years in a row. Um, it's going to keep going down a bit. Um, and then there's sort of a one year drop and we'll see how that actually plays out. And then the high school is really not that far into the drop of enrollment from the peak to where they're going to end up. So the high school is um, just over 1,700 kids plus the choice kids. And um, they're theoretically at the lowest. I mean, I would stop here is about 1,500 kids. Um, and the peak was 1950 or so over here. This is my favorite little chart, and I know it looks like a bunch of noodles and is hard to understand, but I'm going to talk you through it. Um, so one thing that happened is um, the 2015 projections were really, really low. And I think that had a lot to do with the housing market changing. Um, and in, in this period of time, um, sort of right after these projections came out, the housing market started to boom and, and sales went up very quickly in both towns. So um, this was the 2015 projection, the dark blue line way at the bottom. The next year they adjusted it based on the housing changes and it's this light blue line that was 2016. Then in 2017, we went way up here this is the gold line, yellow. Um, and it stayed there the next year, 2018. Then 2019, in the out years, they really kind of went up. And now 2020 is this black line. So we're sort of right in the middle. What concerns me is the difference between last year and this year. The whole uh, projection is 250 to 300 kids fewer than it was just a year ago. And that's based on what just happened this year in the middle of COVID. So, um, you know, we'll continue to work with NASDAQ. I'll be very interested to see sort of what next year and the year after shows. Um, but if I had to guess, I'd say we'd be somewhere between the 2019 line up at the top and the 2020 line down at the bottom here. All right, um, so the enrollment history and projections, this is just putting all three levels on one chart. Um, elementary again is near the bottom, high school is about halfway through the dip and the junior high um, is kind of closer to the bottom. And just a couple of other points um, that were in the October 1 report. Notice that Minuteman had quite a jump this year, and that also impacted some of our high school enrollment. Um, so the Acton students going to Minuteman grew from 37 to 56. So we have 19 more students going to Minuteman 
from Acton, and then Boxboroughs went from six students to four students. Um, so altogether, we had um, a, an increase of 17 students. You know, their new building opened. Um, the, the programming there is, is really excellent with state-of-the-art technology in a lot of the areas. So um, that's just something to kind of be aware of from a, an enrollment point of view that may impact. Um, prior to this, we had nine or 10 per, per year. Um, and this year we had, I think, 25 freshmen that went there. So that could continue that trend. Um, the second thing that was in the October 1 report that I just wanted to point out is we are in um, a period of time where the percentage of students is shifting a little bit towards Boxborough. So we've had um, sort of an increase in Boxborough students relative to Acton students. Um, the three-year average right now is 84.12 for Acton. 84.12, that's down from 85% about three years ago. So it's been sort of gradually going down like a third of percent a year. On our 90 million or so dollar budget, a third of a percent going from one town to the other can have an impact on the assessment. So we'll explain that in more detail when we get into the budget season and we'll show you kind of the exact dollar impact but just so you know it's it's kind of shifting that way and my last point was that um, the economically disadvantaged students or our students who are on free and reduced lunch has stayed at about 11 percent for the third year in a row um, this year's number i'm a little bit less sure about because since we have the universally free breakfast and lunch, not everybody had to fill out the form. Um, so we just might not have 100% accurate numbers, but we've been at 11%. This is the third year in a row, and that's up from 6.75% five years ago. Um, so five years ago, we were under 7%, and now we've been sort of steady at 11%. So there was a lot of data in there. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. And you'll also see some of this again through the budget process. I think you said me, but it was it was hard because you were whispering. John. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> a, a couple of things. So my you know, high level takeaway is and that enrollment is benign in the sense that um, we expect to have similar or smaller numbers of students, which either, you know, at a constant staffing level would, you know, allow us to reduce class sizes or, um, you know, keep class sizes the same and potentially have a slightly smaller staff. But my main question is, um, obviously, these are COVID impacted numbers for a variety of reasons. And I didn't see anything in the NESDAQ presentation um, to try to calibrate this against the state or other communities. Have you had conversations with NESDAQ about what other communities have seen that might make some of our elementary numbers look like they're not real in a sense that everybody went down and that can't all really be going on. Um, so I, what I wanna know in part is, A, did you see that, you know, do you believe that's the case? And then if we believe that's the case, how are we gonna ge generate numbers that we think will reflect what's actually gonna happen, assuming we're fully open next fall? Yeah, um, so also the Department of Ed did a whole survey about this. Um, so they've collected some data as well and they're hoping to make a case to the le legislature that they um, treat chapter 70 a little bit differently this year because they're numbers are artificially low. Um, so what we know is that kindergarten and first grade is artificially low and that we have, I think it's about 25 more homeschool students than we normally have or than we had a year ago. Um, so when we really um, budget out our sections for next year, we've got those numbers plugged in by grade and school um, so as kids unenrolled or went to homeschool, 
we kept them um, separately in our list by school and grade. So we will account for those when we plan for sections. Um, so I don't know that NASDAQ had any particular, I think across the state, kindergarten was particularly low and first grade to some degree and that homeschool numbers are up, which is all the kind of the same thing that we're seeing. But we've kept track of our kids as they've withdrawn or left. There might be a few kids that just never enrolled, but we enrolled, you know, we start enrolling in January, we closed at March 1st. So most of the kids we would have had captured. Evelyn? Yeah, thank you, Tessa. Um, Maria, I would have liked to see um, a little bit more demographic information based on who is really enrolling by race. Um, it's important because our, uh, our demographics is changing a little bit. And also, I really want to see who is really um, by demographics um, applying for these reduced lunches at some point. I know we don't have the data now, but I want to see because the school of thought is always that it's a people of color, brown, black people, how they want people that are moving off the system. And I would want to see, I want, I want it out there. I want us to see, is that the truth? And I know everybody is headed right now and we're giving, we're feeding everyone. But I want to really see, I want people to see that it's not, oh, that's always not the narrative. And maybe it is in Action Box World, but I want to see that at some point. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Evelyn. Um, there is demographic data in there, um, students by race, by school, and by grade. Um, it's not very different than it's been the last few years, um, which is kind of why I didn't highlight it, but I'm happy to um, produce a couple of graphs about it. I don't think we pulled um, students who qualify for free and reduced lunch by race, but we can do that. We have the data. I think it's important for us to know. And if, in, and if it's trending in a certain way, I think that some of that is always important to know because the narrative is always that we all know what the narrative, I don't have to repeat it. <laughs> we, we know where it always goes. So it is important for us to know as a school committee, who are the people that are on the reduced school lunch. And it doesn't have to be, it, it doesn't have to go into the nitty gritty. We don't have to identify people, but it will be interesting to know who they are and what is the demographic. Uh, Maria, I actually was going to highlight the things. I think that I've been looking at those uh, demographic numbers for a couple of years, and I would say that the numbers at Conan and Gates are going up in terms of numbers of non-white students as compared to the percentage of white students. And I just, I, I hope that we're keeping an eye on the fact that we basically have three scenarios happening in our district. We have some schools, a few of them, but some where you know, primarily the, the junior high and high school where students are having the same experience of what they have in the community, which is equal percentages of, not equal percentages, but the, the percentage in their school, percentages in their school are reflective of the wider community. And we have schools that are very, very white, and we have schools that are very, very not. And, um, you know, it, it they're really stark numbers. It's not like they differ by like 5%. I mean, there's a really huge difference. Um, and I just, I don't, I don't want to see that go unnoticed because I think that as part of our, you know, DEI work, like that's, those are questions we have to answer. I mean, we have essentially segregated schools, some of them at the moment. And I think that that's something that we have to keep at, at the forefront, especially, um, as, as we face challenges like COVID and how that affects different populations and everything else. I mean, it's, it's starkly different. Um, and I just don't want to lose sight of that. Okay, I don't think we have any other questions. Thank you for pulling that together, Marie. Um, I guess that will be a stay tuned to see what happens with the numbers and, and where that takes us as we go into next year. Um, okay, so ongoing business, we put together um, a consent agenda to make this go a little faster, especially because we thought we were going to be in the building and we would only have nine minutes left before we had to be done. 
Um, so items on the consent agenda do not usually require discussion and are approved with one vote unless any member would like to hold an item for discussion in a separate vote. I'll read each item name and if any member would like it held, please say hold. And I'll go slow since you're all muted. And so I'll wait for you. But maybe it would help if you like physically raise your hand if you want me to hold something before I move to the next thing. Okay, so the first thing is the approval of meeting minutes of um, 10 29 20 and 11 5 20. The second is a recommendation to accept a gift of $1,000 from Life Touch Studios to the Junior High School for Student Activities. And the third is a recommendation to accept a STEAM donation in honor of Don McKenzie from the Telephone Pioneers of America. Okay, so. If a move to approve the consent agenda. With gratitude, both the donors and Beth for writing minutes. <laughs> Second, right. minutes, but yes. Sorry, Amy, he beat you to it. <laughs> okay, we'll do a roll no call. No problem, no problem. We'll do a roll call vote. Uh, John. Yes. Amy. Yes, with gratitude. Adam. Yes. Kira. Yes, with gratitude. Nora. Yes, with gratitude. Kenny. Yes. Gavin. Yes. Evelyn. Yes, with gratitude. Angie. Yes, with a big thanks. And myself. Yes. All right. That those pass unanimously. Thank you. Um, all right, so the next item on the agenda is actually kind of another big thing. So we're not done yet, and it's a good thing we're not in the building because this would have to be a very quick discussion. Um, we have, um, sorry, in your packet there was a memo that I wrote um, including the recommendation um, for uh, recommendations for Peter's successor contra contract. Um, and a proposed draft contract covering um, the period from July 1st, 2021 to June 30th, 2026. Um, in the memo, I noted um, some of the comparisons to, to um, superintendents in comparable districts. There is a chart included in the packet for you to look at. Um, and for anyone in the community to look at um, to see uh, where we got uh, the recommendations. But essentially, um, Peter's salary started out quite low when he was hired. And um, that was because of a combination of factors. One, he did not have actual superintendent experience. And um, most of his experience was as a high school principal. And, um, and, and, that was that was the biggest the biggest driver was was the lack of experience, and so um, when we hired Peter, he was gracious enough to, to to take our offer and start from there. And over the three years that he's been here, he has more than proved his uh, worth as an unbelievable superintendent that not only has taken great care of our district but other districts have looked to for for guidance and support. So, um, in looking at the the comparable salaries um, and also looking at what those um, those peers would have received as salary increases from 20 to 21 and 21 to 22. Um, if Peter had received 3% salary increases the last um, two years, he would be at approximately 214, 222 in FY22. So that was a number where we started and then looking at the average estimated salary for the 20 other 25 districts, the average there in FY22 is 226, 639. So um, we can see that he's already, would already be at quite a deficit if we were to look at those averages. Additionally, some districts we know provide superintendents with additional financial incentives um, that include money towards an annuity, a car allowance, or longevity bonuses. And if we took those into account, the average of those is 237,163. If we narrow it down a little further and look at just the 10 districts that have enrollment within 1,000 students of Acton Boxborough, their average salary in FY22, including financial incentives, is 238,003. So um, after carefully considering all of those things, uh, the school committee is recommending an FY22 salary of $228,000 for Superintendent Light, 
Um, that would put his salary pretty much right in the middle of those 25 districts. Um, we also recommend offering a five-year contract as we've been extraordinarily pleased with um, Peter's service thus far and would like to keep him on board in order to achieve some of his other goals. I enth enthusiastically move to approve. Second. Um, is there is there any discussion? I know that it was it was laid out in the memo a little bit, but Adam. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, I think um, well, the memo does a great job of laying out uh, sort of the comparables around the the financials for the superintendent's pay. I think it's really important to highlight that the the, the driving factor here has been the amazing performance of Peter, um, both leading up to and through the current situation that we have um, with the uh, COVID nineteen. So, um, you know, I I, I do completely uh, agree with the with the offering of the contract and just want to extend my sincere thanks for uh, the amazing work that Peter's done so far. John? Well, it seems funny to look at comparable districts when we have an incomparable superintendent. Uh, in, in all seriousness, um, you know, I think I do want to echo one of the points that Tessa made, but it's important for people to realize this is a clean contract. There's no you know, funny business compensation, it's all straight up salary, um, which is, you know, highly appropriate. It's extremely transparent. Um, I think the second thing that was important to me, you know, in thinking about uh, Peter and his perspective on being a superintendent is I, I think Peter appropriately sees the superintendency as a general management position with all that implies being, you know, um, a little bit of a jack of all trades, you know, but not needing to be a master of one, but needing to know, you know, how to conduct the orchestra. And, and, and I think from my, you know, perspective on what's gone on over the last year, the most impressive thing, you know, was Peter's sort of strategic approach um, to COVID during the summer. So as everybody has talked about, it's just very frustrating to watch the state move slowly, you know, and in, you know, opposite directions as, you know, we try and chart a course as a district. And I think Peter recognized early on that it was simply going to be impossible to follow state leadership towards a reopening plan. And so therefore, Peter said, you know, I know the schedule we have to be on. So he worked hard with his leadership team um, and, and the staff throughout the district over the summer, you know, really front running um, things that were going on at the state and local level. Um, and I think, that was both, you know, tremendously important in terms of us actually opening up and people looking and saying, wow, you guys are pretty well organized. And I also think it was, it needs to be recognized as risky because, you know, it's easy to say, well, the state said do this, so therefore that's what we're going to do. And it's risky to say, well, you know, we're going to have to work through this ourselves and, and make some decisions. And that's exactly the process that, that Peter went through. And that is, in fact, you know, the mark of excellent management. Um, and then the final point I wanted to comment on is, you know, my perspective is that Peter also has a, a very expansive view on what it means to be educated. Um, and I think, you know, every parent looks at their child and realizes that um, their child, you know, is plotting a unique course and all of those courses will be somewhat different. Um, and therefore they'll be served by uh, a variety of educational experiences. And I think Peter actually really in his heart embraces that. And, you know, nobody, you know, thinks that, you know, I'll go into music so that I can become a superintendent. So Peter's life story, you know, is an affirmation of the fact that, you know, do the things that you're interested in, try and do them as well as you can, um, and things will work out. So I think, um, you know, in a lot of ways that, you know, we couldn't go into right now, you know, Peter has sent that message throughout the district, which I think is, is really critically important for our students. So I wholeheartedly endorse the, this new contract, both its term um, and its compensation. And I guess the last thing that I'll note is there's a lot easier ways to earn this kind of salary other than being a superintendent. This is probably about the hardest way to earn this amount of money. Thanks, John. <laughs> Nora. Um, yes, I just wanted to also say that one of the things I consistently hear from members of the community is their confidence um, in your leadership, Peter, and how um, how much people appreciate your excellent communication and that parents have feel that there's such transparency in 
the way you make decisions and how you think about things. There's a, a real honesty and and a real compassion. And I think that those are, are just sort of on top of the the knowledge and the skill that you bring to your position. So um, I'm just very um, thankful that we'll be able to hopefully work with you again for another another five years. Jenny. So, uh, so I was looking through the proposed contract for some combat pay provisions because I <laughs> wondered many days whether Peter ever regretted his decision to throw his hands in the ring for uh, running our school system, our district during this. And um, I know that would have to offer a lot of other people combat pay. So, so I would I would draw that question. But I just want to say that as as somebody who works on the municipal side um, professionally and then has you know had somewhat of a front row seat to the to the school district side, I'm not sure that most people appreciate that you know not only do we have a you know a completely failed and missing in action federal government, but in my opinion, our state government um, hasn't hasn't fared so much better. And as I talk to other people, other parents, other, you know, just people I know, it really has fallen on our local leaders um, to, to figure everything out in 351 communities across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And, you know, if you didn't have strong local leadership, you're, you're probably in pretty bad shape, school side and town side uh, or city side. And, um, you know, we're very, very lucky that we are Kids have been in school, even though it's not full time, all of them. But um, you know, I'm very, very proud of the work that Peter and the leadership team and our educators and staff have done. Um, and you know, I, I wholeheartedly support this, and, and you know, think it is well deserved. And we're very, I feel very, very lucky as a parent and a mother of two kids in our district. Um, so. I support this wholeheartedly. Well, as someone who gets to work pretty closely with Peter, although I've gotten to the point where I, he calls and says, how are you doing? <laughs> and I always have to take like a big deep breath before I even answer the phone. So um, as much as I, I have enjoyed over the last <laughs> year and 18 million months, I don't even know how long it's been. Um, I, I do, I think that Peter is the consummate professional and he is so unbelievably thoughtful about every aspect of our school community. There are a lot of times where I will ask something or say something and be reminded of why I'm not a superintendent and why he is. Um, he's often able to see so much balance in things that don't seem balanced to me at all, which is a really big, um, I give him kudos for that because I think that that's a hard that's a hard thing to do, and it's really important that it's been. What's really important to getting us through all of this is there are so many things to balance. So um, I'm really pleased with with this contract offering, and you know we're really honored to have you be our superintendent, Peter. Um, Evelyn, did you have something else to say? Yes, um, <laughs> I remember meeting with Peter, maybe he was three weeks into his role in um, as superintendent and um, we had some difficult conversations and I didn't leave his office really thinking that he would represent this community well. I had my biases. I said, well, I don't know whether <laughs> this is gonna work out. But you know, over the years, um, I have been impressed with his leadership and not because I am on the school committee, I'm speaking right now as a parent and um, and all the work that he's done for this community. And, um, you know, I think that you came into a top job and there were a lot of expectations and um, Everyone, everyone wanted their problem solved, including myself. And um, you've taken your time, you've listened over the years. And I think that you've gotten where most of us want you to get to. And I am saying this as a parent and as a school committee member that I am thankful for your service and for what you've done for this community. 
for people that look like me, um, convenient and that there's an equity council group allowing people who look like me, kids not look like me to thrive in this community. I'm thankful to you. And I know that um, there's more to come and you're going to be a principal for everybody in this community, not people of color, not white people, everyone in this community. And I and I know that that was not how, that, those were not my sentiments. When I met you three weeks or four weeks after you got into your job, and I know that there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but I think we deserve this. And I and most importantly, when it was time for you to get your raise, you said, I'm going to not take it because the, the, the district is heading and I'm going to sit back and I'm going to not take my raise and all that. And that is a good testament of leadership, right? That is somebody that really cares about us. And people, I'm sure there will be a lot of backlash about what I'm saying right now, but it's okay. People have uh, own their own opinions, and I own my opinion as a parent of the district. And uh, and most of what I'm saying is as a parent. And I'm thankful for your service, and I think you deserve this. Thank you. Angie, did you get a chance to speak yet? I can't. I'm sorry. I'm losing track of who hasn't put their hands down and, and whatnot. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I agree with everyone who just said, and I still remember the first time that Peter was here, and my first impression that he's so he was so passionate about it, and he's, and he's, and I would say in the past two years, two two more than two years, it's not a t easy two years, and I still see. And he's all in, and he's still passionate, and uh, I was really, really um, wholeheartedly that um, support us. And I just want to mention that the, uh, when we were discussing this, there was no, there was like unanimously that nobody was kind of um, withdraw anything. And it's just, it just very easily that we all kind of came to an agreement. Um, so it is your leadership and, and really appreciate that how you are be able to listen. And I was also want to mention that I was really impressed by the, the finding that after you joined us of, of a year and uh, the, the insightful thing, the information that you can provide it with the, the diverse community. Uh, I really appreciate that. So I'm looking forward to uh, working with you and really happy that the AB school has you. Thank you. Thanks, Angela. Nora, I'm assuming your hand is not meant to be uh, additionally. Okay, great. Thanks. All right, Peter, did, did you want to say something before I move on or you good? So, so, yeah, no, I, I would love to. So, you know, one, I feel like I might be dead um, because it sounded kind of like a eulogy. Um, but I, I very much appreciate, you know, all, all of the thoughts. Um, you know, I it, it, I'll be honest, it's always embarrassing to to do this similar to, you know, an evaluation and things because, you know, and I, I think I try to say this a lot, but, you know, the the work that I do isn't done um, by me usually. It's always someone else uh, behind the scenes doing that work. I just happen to be able to be the person who gets to talk to it at times. So, you know, I think, um, you know, and I, I said this to the leadership team the other day too, um, that, you know, what struck me, you know, since I came here is the quality of people. Um, you know, and I, I think I said to you all as well that, you know, when I, you know, I came in, this was the first time I had been anywhere other than, you know, my previous community in my entire career. And so it was kind of a leap of faith for me. Um, so I kind of came in wide, eyes wide open and, and didn't really know what to expect. Um, but I had some ideas. And, you know, between working with the committee um, and all of the people who have been on the committee since I've been here, um, and in particular the leadership team, because it's obviously been a very stable group uh, since I've been here, it, it's really been about the quality of the people, um, whether it's school committee, whether it's been leadership, whether it's been our educators in the district, whether it's been the various community members or students that I've had been able to work with. Um, the quality of people is just so high. You know, my primary goal 
um, in coming in and being able to talk with you about, you know, a next contract was to be able to feel like I was here for a good amount of time. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful for, you know, the proposed contract. Um, you know, and in particular, I'm, I'm really thrilled with, with knowing that I can be here at least for the next five years. Um, that, that was my big goal is to, to really be able to continue to work with the people that, that I have the opportunity to do that with every day. I just want to continue to express my gratitude for everyone. Um, because as I said, and I, I keep saying, you know, I might be the person talking, but there's a lot of people doing all this lifting uh, behind the scenes. So thank you. Um, you know, I won't keep going and, and drag the meeting on because I know it's getting late, but um, you know, thank you certainly to, you know, the entire leadership team, I, I guess would, would be the way I would end it. And I'm going to end it because we have to vote. I had forgotten to vote. But we actually had a, a motion and a second, and then we all had said all of our nice things, and now we need to actually vote. So, um, John? Yes. Amy? Yes. Adam? Yes. Hira? Yes. Nora? Yes. Jimmy? Yes. Evan? Yes. Evelyn? Yes. Angie? Yes. And me. Yes, with lots of gratitude. I'm looking forward to continuing to work with you, Peter. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, everyone. All right. So <laughs> we have a very short budget update, which is really just um, uh, we'd like to approve a, a revised FY22 budget timeline. So I don't know if Adam or Dave wants to speak to that. All, all I'll say is that we had some discussion with the folks in uh, Box Pro, and the, the iteration that you have now was the consensus that at this point looks like it'll work. And so uh, the highlights, first budget, pre the, the materials went out to the administrators today, so we're already complying with, uh, and if you vote tonight, we're, we're already uh, working our way down the list. Um, first budget presentation, January 21st, preliminary budget vote by the school committee, February 11th. Um, the comprehensive program presentation, Thursday, regular meeting, March 4th, and the budget public hearing uh, and the final budget vote would be either March 11th or March 18th. And there's some back and forth with Foxborough whether it would be too tight, but at this point, uh, we've got some flexibility that it could be either, either of these two dates. Great. Um. So is there a motion to approve the budget? Move to approve. Second. All right. Um, Angie, is your hand up or? No, no, I forgot to. Yeah. Thank you. All right, John? Yes. Amy? Sorry, yes. Adam? Yes. Kira? Yes. Nora? Yes. Ginny? Yes. Evan? Yes. Evelyn? Yes. yes. Angie? Yes. And me. Yes. So thank you to everyone who worked with Boxborough to get those numbers. I mean, those dates ironed out. That's great. All right. Next item on the agenda. And then I promise we're almost done. We have two things left. Um, a review of the open meeting law complaint that was um, received. And Peter, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, included in your packet um, was a copy of an open meeting law complaint. Um, that was filed by a member of the community for, I believe it was the October 15th uh, school committee meeting. So you've had an opportunity to see that. I did have an opportunity to talk with our council um, at the district level about this. Um, and her recommendation was to have the committee um, you vote to, you know, refer this to council um, and she would investigate the nature of the complaint, um, do some fact finding, and then be able to come back to the committee with more information, proposed response, and if any remedies are necessary, um, she would be able to recommend what those are uh, for action. So, um, you know, based on that conversation, you know, I'm recommending that you authorize our district council to investigate and, you know, respond for the school committee, and if any, you know, actions are necessary on our part uh, to remedy this, then she would be able to recommend. Move to approve. Second. Um, Angie, did you have a question? Yes, I do. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, 
by moving to the uh, because I'm on the uh, budget subcommittee. Um, by moving to the uh, council, do we have an estimate on hours or you know because it's gonna cost us right? Do we have a rough idea on how, you know how many hours and what we're looking at, and where would this um, yeah kind of to see where the money situation. Um, my my best guess on that, um, you know, I think it's all dependent upon, you know, what she finds in her initial kind of review of the situation and, you know, any subsequent, you know, discussions and interviews she needs to conduct with members. Um, but my initial estimate would be it would probably be anywhere in the order of between two and four hours, something like that of, of council time, and I believe our rate is somewhere around, Marie, correct me if I'm wrong, probably around either $175 or $200 an hour. So I think we're probably talking under $1,000 total. It, that, that's my best guess at this point, but I, I think it's going to depend on what she finds. Does that satisfy your question, Nancy? You're muted. Yeah, I have a different set of questions. Okay. So um, I think the uh, the um, community member was uh, among the speaker today, and uh, so and I think I remember I heard that the uh, something about the um, considering that if we the school committee will be considered uh, if the school committee can cons consider that to uh, to discuss the uh, issue again. So I, will, I want to find out whether this kind of proposal will be part of the council, legal council process. So my so, understanding, well, Peter can ask, answer that question, Angie, but my understanding is that the open meeting law complaint and, and its possible remedies has absolutely nothing to do with whether or not we rescind the, the decision. He, he okay. wants he wants so it's two separate things. Two separate things. Okay. You know, I think well, it, they they could appear two separate things, but that's the remedy that the community member is seeking. So I don't want to completely separate them out. Um, you know, I think the there's a couple things you know an attorney is likely going to want to do. You know, first is kind of the fact finding side to better understand um, the nature of the complaint and understand what happened and what the facts are. Um, you know, and typically if you're an investigator on something, you're going to first determine the facts and then you might look at possible remedies and outcomes and things like that. So I think, um, you know, it's just, it's following a process. And I think, you know, one of the things, you know, it, my recommendation to the committee would be is to follow the process and just go through the thorough process, um, you know, and to, I, I always find that that has a good outcome. Okay, thank you. All right, are we ready to vote? Okay. Uh, Amy? Yes. Adam? Yes. Kira? Yes. Laura? Yes. Jenny? Yes. Evan? Yes. Evelyn? Yes. <coughs> Angie? Yes. And myself? Yes. All right, that passes. Yes, John. Oh, sorry, John. How did I yes. know? Oh, I'm sorry, John. It's because you're in the top row. Sorry, John. That passes unanimously. I didn't mean to intentionally miss you. I promise. Sometimes I want to skip over you, but this was not one of those times. <laughs> okay. Um, subcommittee and member reports. Um, so, Adam, is there anything additional that you wanted to share from budget? Nope. Okay. ALG? Yes, I can do that. Uh, ALG met this morning. The town gave an update on the the uh, fiscal 21 budget. They're taking things one quarter at a time. Um, so far, Q1 and Q2, uh, property taxes are collections are at 98 um, percent. We're still waiting for when Q3. We'll find out about excise taxes and meal taxes. Um, Town, town hall is still closed, but they have a, a walkthrough window um, and they are working very hard to accommodate any citizen that needs, uh, needs something that they will figure out a way to make it happen, even in COVID times. That's it. 
Vinny, is your hand raised because of a question around that or because you want to share something when it, when we get to that? I have something to share. Okay. I'll call on you a sec. Um, BLF, I, I, I missed a big chunk of the meeting and Adam took over running it, but is there anything in addition to the, but I know the budget timeline was discussed at length. Yeah, a, a great deal of the, the meeting discussion was both the budget timeline and the, the um, COVID-19 uh, cases, both in town and, and how they've been handled in school. Great. Uh, Amy, did you want to update us on your MASC delegate experience? Everything that we vote that was presented was voted and passed. I'm not really sure. That's okay. All right, that's did it. You, I mean, did you enjoy that as part of your birthday celebration? I actually okay. So I completely nerded out and had a fantastic time having listening to the discussions and jumping in. Um, yeah, it's kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. So thank you so much for letting me go to the to uh, this um, convention. meeting of the MASC. It was really, it was really great. Just like being on the Cape, right? No. Well, <laughs> no. Uh, no. All right. Jenny, did you have an update to share? Uh, yeah, I just want to say that I, I did speak to our state rep, Tammy Gouveia, today, um, and she uh, just, you know, we talked to, about a, a bunch of things, and I'll, I'll update you on after I've talked about to the rest of our state delegation, but she did let me know that the House included $50 million for schools, which she thinks is about $150,000 for AB for COVID response, so... You know, that could go anywhere or nowhere, but it's definitely on her radar in terms of the burden, the burdens that uh, this whole um, fiasco has put on our school districts. And, you know, we've talked about that a lot. And um, as I as I stated earlier, uh, you know, it's very frustrating to watch the lack of action from Beacon Hill uh, and, and just, you know, having everything fall on our local leadership in terms of figuring out budgetary and other items. So, you know, hopefully we'll get a little bit of relief. It's not a lot, um, but we are, you know, we, we do have advocates at the state house um, hoping to, you know, to help us out. Um, so I will be keeping you posted on that as I have more meetings with our state delegation. Thanks, Jenny. Did, does anyone that had their hand raised have a question for Jenny? Yes, John, you did? Yeah, Jenny, I, you know, since, you know, both in these remarks and your earlier remarks, the frustration with the state, and I think there's, you know, two elements of that. One is the substance of what has been done in certain cases, and the other, you know, is just the terrible timeline that they've worked to, and, and I wondered, you know, if you had any interest in um, bringing a resolution to the, the school committee uh, where we might, as a group, um, you know, put on the table, you know, our desire to have them make timely uh, progress on the budget next year you know they know when our town meetings are if they don't do anything in a timely way we're forced to guess and I think you know we should at least try you know as a group to to reach out to them and say we as a group you know want you to do better you've got to do better on your schedule I, I have a lot of interest in doing something along those lines and and, and I have to say that um, you know although our House and, and Senate is overwhelmingly Democratic uh, elected officials. It's, it's also ruled with an iron fist by the leadership um, in those bodies. And it's very, very difficult for um, rank and file House members to get any of their concerns addressed. So I, I just, you know, I've been, um, you know, reflecting on the frustration of people who are trying to get some action out of Beacon Hill, even in the, you know, the face of this pandemic, when our, um, our legislature has essentially been on vacation since July, out of session, out of formal session. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm interested um, uh, in any thoughts you have in that area, and I'm happy to, you know, bring them, uh, you know, to work with you if that's something that you want to talk about doing. I, I think something needs to be done. 
it's just it's just uh, it's just unconscionable at this point as far as i'm concerned as a as a proponent of, of good government for my whole career I, I, it's just a, a total failure thanks all right nora kira and i attended the edco roundtable um so um, EDCO's in a great time of transition right now, and one of the things that they brought up at the roundtable is really looking for input from um, districts and school committees about what we would like from them. So that's really the only thing to report from them. Thank you. Um, Amy, do you have your hand raised for a reason? Yes. I was just, I was going to share about FinCom. Oh, so, is that okay? Yeah. Okay, great. So FinCom met last Tuesday on the 10th. The majority of the meeting was focused on developing a point of view. Um, and I will say similar to four years ago, there was a, a great deal of discussion about how to um, measure, how to quantify resources. Um, so there, there's a debate regarding whether to count. So you have free cash from the town, you have E&D from the schools, um, and there's a great deal of debate as to whether we, as Acton, um, include E&D into our free cash account or not. Um, and hopefully, you know, there's, there's, FinCom is still kind of working that out. But, you know, it is that, that idea of taking 80% of E&D and including that in the reserves for, um, in, to, to account for, you know, town, reser town reserves. So, so that's a big discussion. I do want to say that ALG is planning to meet on December 10th at 8.30. Um, assuming that the FinCom has kind of come together and solidified and voted on their point of view. Otherwise, the next meeting will be on June 14th. Thanks, Amy. Kira? I just want to let you know that DEIC is meeting and that subcommittees have been made and sub chairs have been named. Um, and we have a co-chair and she's amazing and doing a great job. Um, we met as a whole group this last Monday and had a very productive um, discussion on multiple things, including the holiday of Diwali, um, which was wonderful. And um, subcommittees will be meeting again over the next couple of weeks until our next big group meeting, which I believe is in December, um, though the exact date has left me because it's 10 o'clock at night. That's fine. And I was going to say that uh, the the um, Troy PTSO met and um, and um, we and, and I think it was decided that that is still a valuable group to most of those members and we're working on getting um, well, we already have some RLP um, representation from Kira, but but firming up who participates in that group. Evelyn, did you have something that you wanted to share? Yes, quickly. Um, they recently convened um, Acting Boxborough High School Parents of Color um, Advisory Group met um, this week. Amy, I think you were on that meeting as well. It was a great meeting. We had 50 parents awesome. Uh, awesome. signed up. Um, I am leading that meeting with um, that group with Lindsay and um, it's, it was fantastic. Our first meeting was really great. We had really multicultural representation from all ethnic groups. It was really great. And our first meeting really went well. I think people like just up about it and uh, more to come on that. Uh, Amy, I don't know if you have anything to add, but I think it was it's a positive first step. I don't. I just think it was, you know, really special. And thank you so much, Evelyn for leading this uh, group. Thanks, Evelyn. Um, I see that Gary has his hand up in the audience. You want to allow him to speak, Peter? 
Here you go, Gary. Thank you. I wanted to go back to something Amy commented on about the Act and Finance Committee. Did I understand correctly that the Act and Finance Committee would like to utilize E and D as part of the Act and Reserves? Did I misunderstand that? So, so is it okay if I talk, Tessa? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. okay. <laughs> no, no, I was just saying that there was a conversation about town reserves and whether we count town reserves that includes 80% of E&D. Understanding that Boxborough owns 20% of E&D. Um, so they're 15.88% well, right now. Well, I mean, I no, I, I, I completely agree with you, Gary. I mean, it, it's, it's been a conversation that I've been involved with for the last five years about whether, um, Acton FinCom or can include the school's E and D in Acton's town kind of free cash reserves. So. I, I was just saying that, uh, again, that is another, you know, again, we're debating this conversation. So, mm -hmm. so some members are saying this is, no, we can't look at town free cash um, and schools E&D is, is completely separate. And then some members are saying, no, we should include um, schools E&D in when we evaluate town reserves and you know amy can i just add on to that a little bit yes please so you know gary i think the conversation actually started at a pretty high level with the general concept that the act and finance committee was concerned about the tax impact on residents this coming year and the the general feeling was to have both town and schools use additional reserves to try and decrease the tax burden on residents um, and to, to think about ways to draw down reserves to accomplish that. I don't think, I didn't hear any discussion that somehow, you know, the district reserves are becoming Acton's money or anything like that. I think it was more of a, a general joint effort to draw down reserves to, to lower tax impact. And, and that piece I just wanted to okay. jump in and say that, um, when I, I've been on the committee for, I don't know, seven, eight years now. Um, and four years ago, when we had this, we had this exact same conversation when FinCom was looking at producing their, their point of view. And there was a discussion about whether you include, when you look at reserve policy, like what are, what are the reserves that you want to have? There was a, a, a big conversation about you know the 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 um the least number of reserves versus the max reserves and how do we count that and where do where do the e and d funds from the schools fit in um so it, again it's that it it is that same kind of conversation well i'll, I'll give you one more comment and then i'll shut up um, I've been attending the school committee for probably over 15 years now as the finance committee representative. And this comes up every few years. A point I want to make is the district is not part of Acton. It's not part of Foxborough. It's a separate entity. B and D is part of the district. Foxborough has our reserves. Acton has their reserves. It's three different sources of funds. I, but I do agree that we should utilize as much of the funds, free cash from Acton, free cash from Boxborough, and e and as a school, as we feel comfortable with to help the, the taxpayers. But I don't believe Acton should be looking at e as part of their funds, the same way Boxborough does not look at e and as part of our funds. Thank you for listening, and I'll shut up. Thanks, Gary. Thank you, Gary. It looks like Charlie has his hand up. Charlie, you can unmute. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, the, <clears throat> having been on the finance committee in the previous century, I can tell you this has been a discussion that's been going on for at least 30 years. But it's really very simple. It comes up at AOG. AOG is looking at the total 
uh, potential budgets of municipal and schools and comparing the potential reserves from the schools and the free cash to that total. When it comes to actually calculating whether the reserves meet some standards, such as what Moody's wants, free, the certified free cash applies only to the municipal budget. As a percentage of the municipal budget, it should be somewhere between 3 and 5%. There is never any question that the school committee has total control of the E&D budget and can appropriate it any way it sees fit. So this discussion is really sort of confusing because it invariably involves both the total of the two budgets as well as the individual budgets. I wouldn't get too excited about it. This is just something that this ALG keeps track of the potential reserves. How much is actually spent on the school side is entirely up to you, the school committee and how much of the certified free cash is appropriate is, is up to the selectmen. It's that simple. Thanks, Charlie. Okay, is it all right if we move on? It's 10.07, we've been here for three hours and I'm running out of steam. Um, Peter, I know that you needed to give a short uh, EDCO update. I will keep this very, very brief. Um, so, you know, the executive director of EDCO had resigned, um, you know, and the board, which is comprised of, you know, a combination of superintendents and school committee members from all the about 20 member districts, um, hired Cindy Tamor as the inter interim executive director. Um, Cindy, I believe, was a former offhand director of student services, special education director in Bedford for years. Um, and was also a superintendent of the Melrose Public Schools for a good number of years. So she brings with her a wealth of experience. She was willing to take on some of the challenges of EDCO. Um, we're thankful to Nadine for her service. Um, you know, EDCO is very much, as Nola said, at a transitional time in its history. EDCO existed for over 50 years, if you remember from uh, last year's presentation from Nadine. Uh, but there are some extraordinary financial challenges going on in the pandemic. And the future of EDCO is very much uncertain at this time. Um, you know, in addition to being a board member, um, this year I'm serving on the Executive Finance Committee for the organization as well, um, just to make sure we're staying very much abreast and in tune with the finances of EDCO. Um, it's something that concerns me greatly, something we're monitoring closely, and as we progress through the year, I will certainly keep you updated, but just not at 10 o'clock. Thanks, Peter. Sure. Um, okay, I have the payroll warrants in front of me, so if Adam and John are, uh, I'll, I'll read them. <laughs> I move that the school committee vote to approve payroll warrants as follows, number P2110 dated 11-5-2020 in the amount of $2,674,249.94. Payroll deduction warrant as follows, number 21-010PR dated 11-5-2020 in the amount of $533,008.68. Vendor warrants as follows, number 21-009 dated 10-29-2020 in the amount of $2,367,068.41. And number 21-010 dated 11-12-2020 in the amount of $987,965.92. Second. Second. Yeah, John. Okay, fine. Give it to John. John? Yes. Amy? Yes. Adam? Yes. Kira? Yes. Laura? Yes. Ginny? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Evelyn? Yes. Angie? Yes. Myself? Yes. All right, those pass unanimously. Um, the FYI in your packet, as Marie noted, includes the NASDAQ enrollment projections in addition to the information that she had in there. Um, our revised ABRSC meetings going along with the, the budget calendar and all that are also in there, as well as uh, the information about the QPR training that, that Peter had mentioned last time. Uh, there's a five. Yeah, and just so you know, in the middle of the chaos of the day in COVID tracing, uh, Don actually managed to get in a full QPR training as well. 
Um, so kudos to Dawn for somehow managing to find some quiet in the middle of chaos. Thanks, Dawn, Paul. you're awesome. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. second. I don't know who got the second in, but Adam definitely <laughs> got the motion. <laughs> John? Yes. Amy? Yes. Adam? Yes. Kira? Yes. Laura? Yes. Ginny? Yes. Evelyn? Yes. Yevin? Yes. Angie? Yes. And myself? Yes. Thank you, everyone. That was a long meeting. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye.